You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Like like after September 11th, they wouldn't have had the... They would never have had the support of the American public to invade another country at that moment in time. September 11th happens, everyone's queuing to sign up to go to war, to fight this enemy. This war on terror. What's that even mean? What did that mean? What we're talking about is predatory gangs of men beating, prostituting and destroying children yeah? and enjoying doing it. Do you think they could possibly kill him off because he's got so big? I don't think he's ever... I don't think he's coming out. And I think that um, he has got too big. He's got too much influence. Door opens, it's the waiting room. Door opens, so I just walk in, I see beards. So I just look and think, oh, fucking hell, man. And I didn't even sit down, because I just stood my back to the, I put my back to the wall. Prison officers locked the door and boom, I lost my teeth. I got battered. Even, I, I, they all rushed me. And some white boy comes up to me and he says, Tommy, you're going to get done with boiling water. Yeah? And I said, who's going to do me with boiling water? And he says, um, and he, he says, whatever cell number. He says, look over. And I looked over and there's a Somalian kid and there's the boy from Bedford. Yeah? And they're talking at the door of another cell. And he goes, mate, the amount of money they've put up for, for you to get done, it might not even be a Muslim that does you. They knocked on my door, then the screws come to my door one time and said, where's your wife? I'm laying in this cell. I'm like, what? And they said, where's your wife? I said, how the fuck am I meant to know where my wife is? Yeah? I'm banged up in here. I don't even get to use the phone at night. So they said, okay, well, there's intelligence that your wife's going to be attacked with acid. I'm like, what? Oh, well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Boom, we're on. We're on. And today's guest, we've got Tommy Robinson back for part two. <laughs> Tommy, good to see you. Good to be seen. First podcast we've done to get censored. Nobody could share it, nobody could comment. I just really released it last week because I know you were coming back on. Again, great hype about it for yourself. Your first book, Enemy of the State. Uh, that that's basically brings us up because I, I watched back the first podcast yeah. last night because I don't want to cover all the stuff we've uh-huh. already covered. And that was a few, what was that, three years ago, that three podcast? Years. Three years ago, yeah. So I watched it back to refresh myself, but that's my first book, which is my life story, talking about everything that's at the truth behind the headlines that people read. Mm-hmm. And then this is the latest one. I just bought this one out recently. Silenced. Silenced, yeah. And this was took off the shelves. They banned it. Where can people get that? You can get it on www.trsilence.com. You can buy them both on trsilence.com. But it's an ironic name. It's, it's called Silenced. It went, it went to number three on Amazon. It was heading to number one. And they banned it. No reason given. Just <sighs> And when I say they, ban, like they banned it, you can buy Hitler's Mein Kampf in 20 different languages on Amazon. But they banned my book. It's mad. Like three years ago, there seems to be a, a shift in yourself as well. I've seen some of your videos, you seem a lot more calmer. You seem to have changed, I wouldn't say the narrative, but something's changed in you, which we'll touch on through the interview. But the last three years, you were everywhere. Yep. You were known all around the world. You were interviews all around the world. You were cancelled. One of the first that to, to ever probably be cancelled. Yep. But it's a... Uh, it's good to have you back on to see what it's all about now. I've seen a few videos on TikTok. You're talking about things that I never thought you would talk about. But first and foremost, how are you? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good, mate. I'm good. This is the first time I currently have no pending court cases. And that's the first time in since my activism. So I've always been awaiting a court trial. I look back on our first po- on our last podcast, I was saying I'm go- I was waiting to go to jail. And I went to jail, didn't I? It was for the contempt hearing again for outside Leeds Crown Court and I was put back in Bel- I was put in Belmarsh so I watched that back last night and um, yeah I'm good I've got no court cases I'm good I'm in a good place did that bring back a lot of memories it did watching it yeah it brought back a lot of memories that it's like when I was writing these books I think Jesus did this happen did this happen like, how have they done this and when I was listening back to our, our one again I, was thinking, I still I'm, I am still bitter about some of the things that have gone on and what they've been allowed to do really what they've been allowed to, not what they've been allowed to do, what they've done and the way it was celebrated. Even my cancellation, even the way, you know, on Facebook, I'm still, I'm, you still can't name me on Facebook, I think. Did you share I it? I got a three day ban for sharing the podcast. You got a three day ban for sharing a podcast. If you mention my name, you get a ban. Like if, if someone puts a picture up with me, they get a ban. Like I, I just, what have I done? 
What have I done? And that's celebrated by everyone. By, or by many. I say by everyone, but by, by many. Many who are in control anyway. We'll talk, well, there's so many topics we can touch on first, but I want to touch on the Quran. Like, for me, I've never read it, Tommy. Yep. I've got Muslim friends all around the world, the yep. best people ever. Listen, some of them drink, some of them smoke a bit of weed, some of them have been in prison. When I go to their mum and dad's house, they're the best people ever. The food's amazing. But obviously, the one thing that I, I don't think anybody can justify is that when you talk about Muhammad, it is stated that he was with a, a girl six, seven years old, and I think he married at nine. No matter what religion, you can't justify that. Even we talk about the Bible as well. Like I think, was it Lot the guy's name was? And he got two daughters pregnant. They're drinking blood. They're talking about slavery. But all religions are quite sat sat satanic. Like they're quite dark and deep. But the one thing that I can't justify or anybody can justify, because I've asked my Muslim friends this, is this real? Is this true? And they, and they say, yeah. Like, Muhammad, Muhammad married Aisha when she, when, he, when she was six. She still had playing with her doll. And he had sex with her when she was nine, which is rape. So she was nine years old. He was 56. So yeah, that, that, that's in their scripture. Um, that's their prophet. Because the Quran has, uh, people think it as his peace. Because if you look at it, there's no drink. There's, there shouldn't be murder. There shouldn't be all those other things that it says. So how do when you debunked all that? Like how, how did you find all that out? Like what is, is it secrets there? Or is it plain in sight for everybody to see? No, it's just, it's just, that's, I read the Ibn Ishtaq's biography of Muhammad, the life of Muhammad. To understand, like we have Jesus, who is this guy? Who is this guy who's revered as the perfect person that everyone should follow? And when I started reading his life, I thought, this isn't perfect and this should not be followed. Yeah? When it comes, like, like he's beheaded 600 people in one day. He was a warrior, a successful warrior. But that's what, so when I talk about Islam, I have looked into it, studied it. I, I bought out my own Quran. That went to number one. But that's, that's banned from everywhere as well. It's called Muhammad's Quran, why Muslims kill for Islam. But that was, um, and that was, so when you pick up the Quran, it's not in chronological order. So one thing Muhammad said one day is next to Sankey said 15 years later. Now abrogation in Islam says what he says later in his life supersedes what he says earlier. So the latter things he says. So there is a lot of peaceful verses in the Quran, which people keep, keep quoting. You've heard the one where if you kill one man, you kill all of humanity. Like Nick Clegg quoted that verse after Lee Rigby was beheaded. If you kill one man, in the Quran, it says, if you kill one man, you kill all of humanity. If you carry on reading that verse, it says, unless they cause mischief, and then they must be executed and have their hands and feet cut off. So in context, that's not a peaceful verse, but it's pushed to us as a peaceful verse, totally out of context. So yeah, there's, as you said, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of bad history in lots of religions, but I, I obviously had my focus on Islam or I had my, I had my focus on Islam because I believed Islam was the biggest threat to this country, to our freedoms, to our safety, to our security and to our stability as a country. I, I believed because I've somewhat shifted my mindset on, what, on the biggest threat where we're at now with, what, with the developments over the last few years. But my biggest concern, and that's just through my life of growing up in Luton, was Islam. Because if we look at the, the stats with sexual offences in the UK, I think it's over 80% are white, but the stat that you had says three years ago is legit as well, where the majority of grooming gangs is nearly 80% Muslim. Yeah, so I, Asian, I, think it's, but... I think it's nearly 90. I think it's actually <clears throat> exclusively like paedophilia, like lone predatory individuals acting alone is ex pretty much exclusively white, yeah, in this country. It's, it's upwards of 90%. But upwards of ninety percent, upwards of ninety percent of this country is white. Yeah, so it's a demographic that fits with the demographic of this country. When you look at grooming gangs, which is large groups of males acting together, then the statistics show that eighty-four percent to ninety percent of the men convicted of this crime are of Muslim, are, 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 are of Islam, are, are follow Islam. Yeah, are, they're Muslim names, and you get that from taking all the names and then checking the the origins of the names now 84 percent. now muslims make up four to five percent of this country but yet they're responsible for over eight, eight so let's just say over 80 percent they're responsible for over 80 percent of the convictions of gang gang rape of children why that's the question i i ask why and it's something that we have to look into to understand is is why and you're not allowed to ask that question it's like well, okay well say we've got Sikhs in this country how come they're not doing it we've got Hindus in this country how come they're not acting like this and that becomes into the belief system that's what you start looking at then the belief system of Muslims when it comes to the 
legal age of sex, of what they believe, if they're following their book, if what they believe is acceptable. And then it becomes into, which is where I go down the path, which people don't like, is there are multiple verses, four or five verses in the Quran that say, outside of your four wives, you can take whatever your right arm possesses. This is only when at war, yeah? So when at war, in the Quran, it says when at war, they can take women as sexual slaves, non-Muslim women, outside their four wives. Totally acceptable. Now, we can, no one can argue that the 1,400 children in Rotherham were not taken as slaves. They were taken, they were pimped, they were beaten, they were abused, and some of them were murdered as slaves. The question I keep asking is, why is it the numbers? Why so many Muslims acting like this? Why is it a predominantly Muslim crime in this country? And, and again, if we, it, I've, I've done a four-part four part series. It's going to be a six-part series called The Rape of Britain, which is exploring this avenue in Telford. And while, while we're on this avenue, we'll just I'll point out, because some people need it pointing out, of course, I don't think every Muslim agrees with this. Yeah, my my Leeds court case when I was sent to jail for asking the men who were walking into court how do you how do you feel about your verdict, I made very clear in that video. There's Muslim lads I have grown up with in Luton Town, yeah, who would want to fill these men in for the acting the way they that they've acted. They would totally be opposed to these crimes, but there's still this massive problem. Yeah, so we've got to be able to talk about it, talk about it openly, explore it openly. Okay, I'm not saying every Muslim's doing this. I'm not saying it's exclusively all Muslims, okay? What I'm saying is there's a massive crime, there's a massive overrepresentation. We need to understand why. Anything we can understand that can deter, limit, or stop the numbers of young girls that are being prostituted, pimped in our towns and cities, we need to explore and look at. And in Telford, Telford has a 1.7% Muslim population, yeah? This is Telford. The police investigation in that town identified a thousand victims that were used. In the police investigation, they identified over 250 Muslims. Yeah, in the town. Okay, when you take the demographic of, Mus uh, of Muslims in Telford, one point seven percent. You take away the over uh, under sixteens and the over sixties. You take away the women. Yeah, there's only like twelve hundred Muslim men. There's only twelve hundred Muslim men, and you've got two hundred and fifty of them identified by the police. Another, another, another. Um, an, an independent inquiry identified three hundred and fifty. We sat down with one girl, and we identified. We got two hundred and three names of men who had raped her in that town. Yeah. Then you're talking like nearly 20% of the men, 20% of the Muslim men in Telford were involved in prostituting and raping children. Five women are dead, including children, in that town. This is just one small town called Telford with three and a half thousand Muslims in it. Yeah? This is a massive problem. Now I looked at that, I looked in that city and what I've done is I interviewed 12, I spent time with 12 girls. I spent about 18 months with them. Got to know them, gained their trust. Um, listened to their stories and done a real in-depth investigation into what's been happening in Telford. We found police corruption. Police were working with the gangs. We, um, we identified, as I said, we identified upwards of 250 men involved. And what I'd done is each time the girls named the men, we dissected it all. And then we pieced it together. So once the name men were named by more than three, by, by three girls, yeah. So we've got three girls who don't know each other naming the same men, prostituting, grooming them, raping them. Now, the police investigation, as I said, identified over 200. They prosecuted 10. You prosecuted 10. You've got over 200 men who rape girls in this town and you charge 10. You're, talk you're not talking about l l small crimes here. You're talking about, when I say I spent time with these girls, their lives are destroyed. Their families are destroyed. We're, tw we're 15, 20 years on and some of the victims, they're still suicidal and trying to kill themselves. They're still hooked on drugs. They're still depressed. They're still suffering. Yeah? The men swanning around in sports cars, running businesses, all of them running businesses, successful businesses in the town. In, in the groups we identified, we, we had the leader in the mosque, the leader of the Muslim Council of Telford was one of the main men identified by three people. Yeah? So we showed all of this in, in an investigation. And then we explored, we asked the girls, what were they called? Was there any mention of, and they're all called Gura, they're all called dirty Gura, white girl. It was all racial. There was many religious comments made. So just exploring it, I, and, and it was probably, I'd say, out of everything I've done, the most difficult, it fried my head. It, 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 I, I don't know, I, I think anyone who deals with sexual abuse victims or anyone who spends time in looking into these cases or understanding these cases needs a, re a massive reward because 
the things that they take on themselves by uh, by listening and, and and going through the crimes. It's horrific what has happened to these girls. And no one's faced up. These men are still running around Telford now. Yeah? We've produced documentaries of multiple victims, naming them, giving, giving their stories of what they've done to them. They're all still running around Telford. Do you think you've got anywhere with it, Tommy, over the last five years, like doing what you're doing, or has it just become so draining in your life that you think, what's the point? Uh, no, I totally, I totally don't, th I know we've got somewhere with it. Everyone now knows the word group, they call it grooming gang, don't they? The grooming, like a nice little polite word for it. It's called love jihad in India. It's called lover boy in Holland. What we're talking about is predatory gangs of men beating, prostituting, and destroying children yeah, and enjoying doing it. And it's not about their sexual gratification when you go through what they're doing to them. When you go through what they're doing to them, they, we, we had one girl, we had, we had one girl who gives us the interview who the man drags her out of the car, he drags her up to the woods, he makes her, he sticks his cock in her mouth and then afterwards he urinates all over her. He stands and pisses all over her. That same man then murders a girl. Yeah, so What's he spend in jail? Two years? Uh, two years he spends in jail and now he's running a restaurant I just had a woman Sarah Sands on who killed her son's abusers three and a half years she got to double her they sentence they doubled it I've, doubled seen, it. I've seen it they doubled it yeah. she she went round to his house he's a paedophile living on the for estate for 40 years he's been doing it he's been, for 40 years he's been uh, I, I, I remember that case is a couple of years old yeah 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 I read it at the time mm hmm what a hero she is yeah amazing she should be hailed as a hero she's she should be so she is a hero because, yeah. but, has she had support not yet she's kind of still dealing with the... so she has she had support either not just for herself for her children but what i mean is she's left broken yeah. when when she was away from her so she's been taken from her children she was taken from her children for... because yeah because the court system gave that man bail over nearly 30 crimes he'd done and they gave him bail and she was more worried that he would go and do more stuff to her kids so she took it into her own hands went to see him for him to admit his guilt he said your son's a lion she gave him it eight times and then she got three and a half years which is not too bad, but... No, it is bad. It is, no, that's a, the double dissent is no, 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 because whose fault is it? It's the judge's fault to give him yeah. bail. He's a prolific offender with a history of offending, right? When I looked at him, he's a prof I've looked at it. I remember looking at it. He's a prolific offender. And this is like all these men. Why are they on bail? They're giving bail. They all get, they're all just disappearing. And it's not like, as I said, it's not like... In our cases, it's not like... It's not like one girl. You've got a thousand girls. Yeah. you've got a thousand girls in Telford that you've identified that have been raped and you prosecuted 10 men out of 200 so what basically what they do it, what they've done to this country the police and people have been rewarded when you look into this yeah so like Manchester there's a police officer in charge in Manchester Ident they identified 100 girls after a 15 year old girl was murdered there yeah they identified 100 girls they identified all the men that were involved I think this is what Maggie Oliver might have resigned over anyway that they, they, they identified all the men involved they're, they bring their prosecution, they arrest them all, yeah? And then they ditch the whole case. Three months after they ditched the whole case, that head police officer that ditched it receives the highest reward from our, from our royal family, yeah? Receives the highest reward. For our, they're rewarded for cut this. If it was happening in one town, there was a cover-up, yeah? You say, okay, one, one police local council has covered it up. When it's happened in every town and city across the country, and it's all been stemmed and covered up for decades, yeah? That is a conspiracy, Okay, who's behind the conspiracy? Everyone knew it was going on. Everyone's known it's going on. So when you say, oh, have we got anywhere? Yeah, people now know about it, but what they've done is they just make token arrests. So in Telford, they arrest 10. You know, you know 200. There's another 190 that you know have raped kids and they're still walking around the town. And that's why we focus into, I focus my documentary in Telford and my last episode is on the council. We're going to go for the council. Yeah, And the, we're going to go for the council because the council... These are all white men, 10 straight white, 10 white men who worked for Telford Council, all wrote to Amber. So when, when this was breaking in Telford, yeah, and it was bubbling in Telford, there was calls for an independent inquiry. These 10 men wrote a letter to the Amber, 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 Amber Rudd, what was her name? The Home Secretary. They wrote to the Home Secretary. They, so, they all signed it, uh, to asking her not to do an independent inquiry. One of these men's jobs is in charge of child services. They're all, so this cover-up, this was a Labour cover-up in Telford. Because um, they've, they've all got things to lose because they've all let it happen. They've all known it's happening. 
and then they've all been rewarded all through their careers. Anyone who's, anyone, when you look at all the different cities, when we look at, Ro I looked at uh, Rochdale, Rotherham, one of them just got the place to be, be the MP, didn't he? They put him up for the MP. They've had to reverse it because the outcry. But they've all been rewarded for covering up. What makes the changes then to protect kids? For me, I've always said it, bring back hanging. Like, if you harm my kid, you should be dead. Like, in America, I know the, the cast rate, people who harm kids, I think, in Russia, you're not allowed to leave the country. Um, you get life sentences. But here you can change your name for less than 20 quid. You can change your well, identity. You can now, thanks to Nicola Sturgeon, yeah? Yeah, you can, <laughs> unbelievable. You can change the passport details. That Because a lot of these people who've, like that old man Sarah killed, he changed his name numerous occasions. I had Della Wright on, who was abused at six years old. The kid, that kid who was, had already had previous, was taking him, taking Sarah to um, to see the parole officer. She was sitting outside that. Like, changed his name, changed his identity. That like, Why is the law so lenient here? And why does it seem as if nobody cares about kids? Because the hierarchy don't care about kids. That's very established. That's very, the elite, the cab the cabal, whatever you want to call it, whatever name, the matrix, which has become a, fa a famous name for it all now. Um, they actually do not care about kids. There's, there's global elitist paedophile rings. There is sacrificing of children, which people fit, would have thought sounded mad. You've seen the whole Balenciaga story that blew up, right? Mm -hmm. Literally child pornographic, por pornographic pictures of children in a major brand's main advertisement, all hidden. All the codes hidden, the bow, you see, they spelt, spent the word wrong on the, you know, on there, they had the, um, the reel of tape on the table of their Balenciaga advert. And instead of saying Balenciaga, it had B A A L. Now, bow was the god of child sacrifice. It's all straight in your face. Yeah. And it all goes all the way to the top. Why do you think Jimmy Savo ended up involved with the royal family? Because it goes all the way to the top. Mm -hmm. When you look <laughs> at it, they're all at it. They're all at it. And I know that sounds crazy. And, and people, to people who haven't researched this or looked into it or really had a delve, this is a rabbit hole. I, I don't know if I'll advise going down because it's going to shock the hell out of you. When you look into all of it, when, when I started looking at Balenciaga, now I started looking at the art side of it. And there was two brothers, the, the Chas Chaseman brothers. I looked at their art and I started looking at all this art and thought, no, this art is, this ain't art. Now, this is child pornography, yeah? And this is all all the top corporations. It's all interlinked. Mm -hmm. It's all interlinked. And when I say it's all linked, linked, even I think the Balen we'll get onto Ukraine, but the Balenciaga top fashion head is then part of United 24, which is a a platform for raising money that Zelensky is head of as well. And everyone, Ukraine has always been the centre for money laundering and child trafficking. That's what Ukraine was, yeah? Prior to this war, prior to everyone frying up their Ukraine flags. That's what Ukraine is and has been used as by the elite for decades and decades. What do you think about the war in Ukraine now? What do I think about it? Um, it was orchestrated by the European Union and their expansionist ideas. So we started that war. Um, why did we start that war? Who's behind the war? We, go, we can go deep from down rabbit holes on all of this. Like I just see BlackRock have come out you know who BlackRock, a yeah. corporation, a hundred trillion pound corporation who receive, say they get a hundred billion taxpayer, it's all taxpayers' money, it's all us funding it. They get a hundred billion a year coming in from the American government to build weapons that no one needs, to, that are a ridiculous expense. They need wars, yeah? They've always, they've always found ways for wars with, with Afghanistan, with Iraq, illegal invasions of countries to destroy them, break them down. And BlackRock have come, out, come in now because BlackRock are now doing the investment to rebuild Ukraine. You blew the shit out of it. You made sure it went to war. Yeah. You provoked a war. So in 2014, this is where I look at, I don't know if you looked at what's happened on January 6th in the, in the United States, which is where over Tr Donald Trump's election, people come out and protested Congress and they called it a, what they call it? They said it was like a, um, a, a insurrection. So they said people attacked the government and they built it up as this big terrorist attack, which it wasn't at all when you look at it. They opened the doors. The police literally opened the doors and let people into the American Congress. So January 6th, 2014, armed militias supported by us overthrew a democratically elected government in Ukraine. Yeah, That was celebrated by all of our world leaders, the same world leaders, the Bidens, the, the, the same world leaders that are wanting to lock people up for walking into Congress and calling it an insurrection, all clapped and applauded what happened in 2014 in, in Ukraine, and they called it democracy. And then, and then what happened is once they gained power and they outed the democratically elected government, they then launched a civil war, which 
Russia, even if you look now, yeah, so the areas that have gone off, gone, gone, gone Donbass and these areas, even in 2012, they have always elected pro-Russian. People speak Russian. They are Russian, yeah, in those areas of, uh, of Ukraine. They, uh, and we, when... When the new puppets come in control of Ukraine, which was all about getting the European Union, it, they want NATO there. Yeah, that's all it's been about. It's about bringing Ukraine into the EU. It's about NATO. It's about destabilization of Russia. It's about getting rid of Putin. That's and who's behind it all? It's, I've just watched what's happened. It, it frustrates me so much watching. I think sixty Russians were set fire and burned alive in one day. Yeah, they set fire to them all. No one ever faced prosecution for it. All these things were going on. The outlawed speaking Russian. The racism against Russians was encouraged and supported. So I watch all of this going on and think, and the whole time we're all flying Ukraine flags and celebrating it and saying that, saying that it's it's great. But basically, it's, and all of our all of our taxpayers' money, I think 100 billion has been given from America. Yeah, it's just used for money laundering. This war is used for money laundering. But you're not looking now and realising how easy it is the masses can be manipulated. Oh, totally. If it's not standing outside their home with pots and pans, yeah, you're, you're focusing on wallet that people need to understand there's families that fund both wars and that's going right down the rabbit hole you can go deeper and deeper and deeper to get a better understanding they called David Dyke and that crazy 30 years ago a lot of stuff he says man is fucking on the bang money on. bang on well how did you when did you start opening your eyes to it all because for a man who started the EDL who's proper English through and through would do anything for his country and you start questioning things look when was that realisation for you it's it was the I'd say the cancellation the looking at the world globalist view Seeing the world globalist view against the interests of the nation states, against the interests of... Uh, um, I watched Donald Trump's speech when he went to Davos and he basically told them that um, economics... It, he was focusing not on what globalism. So when I was looking at globalism, looking at what they've done, and then I looked at... And Ukraine really busted for me because I looked at Ukraine and started looking at what they've done there. If we destabilise that country, you don't care about the Ukrainians in it. You've launched a war. You've, you've, when we say we've got, you've gone back on every agreement you had with Russia... Yeah, every agreement you've carried on pushing our forces closer to surround him, yeah, to surround the country. You have, and it's all, and why? That's what I kept asking. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? And it's all to do with the banking. And, and, and then I started, and then I looked at, I looked and thought deeply about what we did in Iraq and Afghanistan. And well, do you know what? When, because we were always told that we're fighting insurgents. Um, do you know what? You come into my country, I'll be an insurgent. You'll be calling me an insurgent and terrorist. Because if you invade a country based on bullshit, yeah, to destroy it, then those people are going to come out and fight you. Now, I've always been, had a real strong allegiance to our armed forces, loved our armed forces. But as I start, when I start going through all the conflicts, I just think we that our armed forces are used as cannon fodder for a globalist plan that needs to destroy certain countries, that needs control of countries to inflict their worldview and force the, their world that they want. And then, and Ukraine really brought it home. And then, and then I sat and thought about, I sat and thought about how the conflicts in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, look at Syria, they tried to get rid of Assad. We were on the, we were on the side of ISIS, funding ISIS. Um, we created the Taliban. We and then give them back the country of the Taliban and act like and uh, and these leaders act like they give a shit about women's rights. It winds me up. I think you see what's happening now with the Taliban. I, I follow what's going on in Afghanistan now. It, it's, it's 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 disastrous for women. Yeah, but they acted like they cared. They acted like we went in there for that. Yeah, no, you didn't go in there for that at all. You didn't go into Libya. You, you, you didn't. You went in against Gaddafi because he was becoming the king of Africa, because he was coming too successful, because he didn't want your banks and didn't want your finance and didn't want your currency. He wanted to weaken your American dollar. Yeah. So when I look at all the things you've done, and then I think about if I, if I was one of the, if I had family in, the, in those countries, yeah, it would radicalise me. Yeah. I'd be calling the British government terrorists. Do you feel kind? Um, do I feel conned? Yeah, I feel I feel conned. I think we've all been conned at, at times. We've been conned for decades and decades. Absolutely conned. Um, I, do I feel conned? Do I feel, mate, look, does it change my view on Islam? No. Do I feel total sympathy for many of the Muslims at those times, those invasions? I just think, Jesus, man, we were to be, what they told us, and no one's been brought to justice for what they told us. It was all lies. 
It was all bullshit. No. They went in there and did not care about carpet bombing and bombing and bombing and bombing. And a million people cared and they don't give a shit. Well, Tony Blair's done the most destruction. Tony Blair's you've done the most destruction. He's sitting directing everyone. And, and you've him. got to look at Donald Trump who gets so much stick, but he was only president never to start a war. You look, if you've got Obama... Bush, Clinton, they've done more damage to civilians, to human life and history. Like, it's unbelievable. Even, we've got to touch about the British as well. Like, my great, great, my grandparents and that fought in the war and I loved them to bits. Like, but the Britain has invaded over 90% of the world. Like, it's unbelievable. Is it greed and power? Or do they have the right to do it? Or do we get brainwashed to think, okay, you can go and, if you talk about... No, no, they build, they build it up to, so then when they believe, like, sept like after September 11th, they wouldn't have had the, they would never have had the support of the American public to invade another country at that moment in time. September 11th happens, everyone's queuing to sign up, to go to war, to fight this enemy. This war on terror. What's that even mean? What did that mean? Well, you look at Gaddafi, he was, I think everybody had jobs. I think there was no homeless. I think universities were free like education around the world. Like, but we are led to believe they're bad people. Saddam Same as Syria. Has, Saddam Hussein. Same as Syria. And so is it gold? Is it poppy fields? Is it oils? Like, we don't know. Is it greed? I don't know all the ins and outs. I can watch a few YouTube videos and take more assumption. But for me, my soul, there's just something not right in this world. Like, my job is just to question everything. I always question everything. No matter the guest I've got on, everybody sees the world differently. From you sitting now to you were three years ago, it's totally night and day. You're seeing the world differently. Like, when do you then look at it and go, shit, but do you have any regret from the past who you were uh no 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 i believe that look everything that happens in your life happens for a reason and and even the negative things will help build your character i think i am the person i am today because of everything i've gone through in my life um i think i've done the things i did with the english, english defense league and set out because of what i'd gone through in my life um i think you learn you make mistakes. Like, I'm not going to sit here and say I haven't made mistakes. I've made lots of mistakes. I've done lots of things I wouldn't have wanted to do, but do I regret them? No. Do I regret them? No. Um, but it's like, I just think, I, I just think when, you, when we're looking at it now and I look at globalism and I look at the power and then COVID's come into it, yeah? And then look at what they're doing. And then I sat there and I used to look at Islam and I, I still do, I still look, I don't, Islam's a problem, yeah? It's a problem for freedom. It's a problem for lots of things. But then I look at this, the power that they're taking from us. So even like now recently, like the globalists fund the the um, the stop oil uh, protesters. Yeah? So they fund these protesters to go out and block all the roads. Yeah, All their funding comes from globalists. So they stop the roads, they get on bridges, they shut the roads. The police are literally told to stand down. That's what they do. The police were told to... So the police stand there while these people sit and block your roads. The public become furious because you're sitting in traffic for eight hours. <laughs> Everyone's going mad about these protesters who are just walking around and not being stopped from causing mayhem at all. And then now Rishi Sunak is, is bringing in laws that's going to take all of our freedoms. Yeah, So they create the problem. That's what they're doing. They're creating the problem. Then they come in with the solution. But it's a problem that they've created anyway. And if the police just acted and done their job in the first place, you wouldn't need to bring in more laws that are going to infringe on all of our rights. And all it's constantly about, which we witness, which I witnessed with I thought, when I saw which at first, who knew what it was, yeah? But then you've seen the, manip the, manip the manipulation of figures, the taking of rights, the total authoritarian tyranny by governments, and all in the name of healthcare. And then you start, and, and, I, and then it was when I started piecing all the pieces together, wars, wars abroad, then you've got even you've got climate change, and just thought, are oh, these bastards? These bastards use whatever it is. So even we want about BlackRock, BlackRock need war. They're, they fund wars. They're behind wars. Then they want to rebuild the countries that they've, that they've destroyed anyway. They keep getting richer. It's our money. Any, anyone, have you been asked that, about your money going to Ukraine? And all our money's just took and sent there, yeah, for their war. Okay, so they're sent there for their war and it'll be sent there to rebuild Ukraine. And the whole time we'll keep having the propaganda of the media, throwing Ukraine flags up, everyone cheering about how great Ukraine is. Zelensky's a hero, apparently. He's brought into Congress in America. All these things are going on. He's an actor, right? And he's acting now, yeah? All this is going on. They're getting richer and richer and richer. Climate change is exactly the same. Who's the biggest investors now in climate change? BlackRock. It's all the same, yeah? 50% of the EU budget, climate change. 
There is no climate change. It's all bullshit. You're lying about it. You're lying. It's just another tax. It, who, who was the biggest organized? The Rockefellers, when they were funding feminism, what was, they were supporting this big feminism like, like they give a shit about women, yeah? about feminism. Get all the women out to work, which is what they've done. I look at all of, and when, when I started piecing it all together from Black Lives Matter, I started looking at all of it. It's all about destroying the family. It's all about weakening the men, the men. And, and you can see, so Black Lives Matter, I've had this on their website. They, what they wanted to um, break down the family, destroy heteronormativity. Heteronormativity, men and women. What's wrong with men and women? What's that got to do with black lives? Yeah. What is, uh, what is LGBTQ+, because black lives matter, uh, when it, as an organisation which is funded by all the same people. Yeah. So they've got all these different groups that they're funding. It's all about pushing their narrative and changing the direction. They're changing the direction of our nations, whether we like it or not. They're changing the narrative. They're changing the discussion. They're enforcing their ideas on all of us. And it all comes back to their worldview and their world plan. And to get their worldview and their world plan, they need weak, feminized men. And that's what they've been in the process of creating for decades. When you've done your rant for Black Lives Matter, what was the reaction for that? Oh, okay, man, when I, I went on my rant against Black Lives Matter, and I went on my rant because I was... Oh, do, you know I went, went on my, do you know why I went, went on that rant? Um, do you know, the, you've watched this documentary I just sent you about yeah. this, Ellie, yeah? Ellie Williams. Ellie Williams is a girl who has been uh, charged and convicted now of lying about Muslim men who she said groomed and trafficked her in the town of Barrow. I've got a documentary coming out on that this week. When I'm up there, you see the lad who spat in my face. On a motorbike. On uh, yeah, a bike. Comes over on a bike, spits in my face. I give him a couple of slaps, um, which is justified. He flemmed in my face. Self-defense. And the police come and arrest me at a house, at the Muslim fella's house. I hide the SIM card. I, I, hide the, I, hide, I hide the memory stick. I'm arrested on a GBH Section 18 because he breaks his leg in that. Yeah, I'm arrested on GBH Section 18 and I'm arrested on, um, on a hate crime because he says I called him not uh, non-binary something. Yeah, We'll get on to non-binary and all. He, say, he says I call, called him a non-binary faggot or something like that. So I'm arrested on a hate crime. So I go home and think, it's all right, I've got all the footage here. Proves he spat at me. So come home from cells, come home, get, get home from Barrow, plug the thing in, and my cameraman had deleted all the footage when the police were coming in. So I've got no footage. So then I, then I sit there and I think, I'm on GB8 section 18, and I'm on a hate crime, and I've got no evidence. I'm, I'm in trouble now, yeah? So I shit myself. And, um, and I, come out my, I come out of my kitchen, and then I'm watching Black Lives Matter. And bearing in mind, I've spent 10 years looking at Black Lives Matter. It didn't just create over George Floyd. I know who the organisation is. It was created by two Marxist feminists, yeah, whose job is to push the New World Order, is to push their agenda, is to destroy the family, is to break. They want black people enslaved at the bottom. They, they still are on plantations. You're on the Democrat plantations in the United States at the bottom. They don't want you to succeed. They don't want you having fathers. In the 1960s, 80% of black men in, in the United States had a dad. Yeah, Now it's 20%. Okay, they've done that. That's been planned. That is the racism. Yeah, you want people want to talk about racism. That's the racism. Who's behind that? The same people who are funding, black, creating Black Lives Matter. Yeah, they want to destroy you. They want to break your family. And uh, the biggest, the, the biggest thing they have to do is break the family. A strong family, a strong father figure, prevents a lot of these things that they want. Yeah, this whole we get onto the LGBTQ plus stuff. But that's what. So I come home, haven't got the footage. Turn the news on, see the Commonwealth statue being attacked in London. I know that the people behind this are the same Antifa, the same, it's all the same people, yeah? But I know that now they've whipped up the black community for what are genuine grievances to historical abuse. They've, they're using the black community to cause a revolution that they can't, yeah? Because they want the trouble, they want it on the streets. I know that Black Lives Matter, there's 30 people who are dead in the United States, many of them black, yeah? From these riots and killings and then all of a sudden I think it's in my country now. That, this, that division that you that political division that comes around every four years every time there's election in America is now in the UK. And it, and it wound me up. And I went on a rant and it was an ill-timed rant. It was an aggressive rant. Um, and it had a terrible effect for me. How so? <clears throat> because it just caused me mayhem, man. Because oh, I've done it on a Russian media, social media app. So I'm sitting here on VK, in, which, which I end up getting banned from as well. I'm on VK in Russia. I'm ranting about Black Lives Matter as an organization, not about black people. Black Lives Matter, yeah? What they're doing now what this is bringing now, the division it's going to bring. Getting on the knees at football, that didn't help. What do you, what do you think that solved racism? That, that, you think that helped in any way? It's, that's a Marxist, Amer come from America. So people are angry with it. So people are booing. Then it's caused more division, which is the purpose of the organisation. So I've gone on this rant and, um, and it's gone viral everywhere. What about, who's the NFL player that didn't take the knees at Kaepernick? Yeah, yeah. He never took any, but he got released from... 
NFL. He, 30, 40 million dollar contract cancelled, man, wrapped up. Like, it's just mad how... So he got cancelled on the other side of the process. Yeah. But you can't speak out against the masses like you know you you get cancelled. How did how does two boys from Luton become two of the biggest names in the UK? Well, Andrew Tate went worldwide, most good good man. Like, I've seen his interviews, he says you're a solid guy, he always says you've you, you get a good friendship. How did that relationship start? So Tate's yeah, Tate's from Luton. Um well he's from America, but come to Luton and he boxed at Storm Gym. So I know people who trained with him, fought with him. And um, Amir, so Amir is Amir is a Bosnian, ex-Bosnian Special Forces, who's the trainer there. He's a very well-respected man, again, a Muslim man, but very well not, I've never, everyone I've always spoke to, I ask about everyone, and everyone holds him in high regard. And I think he was like a mentor for Andrew Tate, I think. And um, so, yeah, I got to know Andrew Tate. I, I, did, I did travel out to see Tate in 2018 when I got cancelled. When I got cancelled, because Tate wanted to set up a TV studio Pretty much what he's gone and done, yeah? But he wanted to do it, uh, and for me, at the time, and there was all these different options, but um, he wanted to do it in Romania, and I didn't want to be, be in Romania. So nothing come of it, but that's when we went. I went out there to meet him for those discussions. Spent a couple of days out there with him, kept in contact with him over the years. Um, yeah, that's it. And then, and then, boom, he's become the most Googled man on the planet. But he's always done and said what he's doing now, mm. which is... Some of the things he said, I tried to say it to my son because all the kids are talking about Andrew Tate. And then my son says he's a billionaire. I said, he's not a billionaire. So Tate says he's a billionaire. Right? Tate says this, Tate says that. Tate says lots of things. I, 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 create, I, I view it like Tate was creating a image, creating a character as such at times. Saying things that were pur purposely controversial, but saying things that he means at the same time. How do you mix the two? You know? Talking about lots of positive things about men and how men should be. But um, yeah, he he blew up, onto and now he's currently sitting in jail, isn't he? Do you think they could possibly kill him off because he's got so bad? I don't think he's ever. I don't think he's coming out, and I think that um, he has got too big. He's got too much influence. Um, look at what when listen. I'm seeing all the allegations against him now. Yeah, I had an ex worker called Lucy Brown. She was offered £5,000 by Andrew Gilligan. Andrew Gilligan is a top journalist in the UK. Yeah? He works in the top newspapers and he works alongside a group called Hope Not Hate. He, he's worked with them on di or coordinated with them on different things. So Hope Not Hate have been against me for years. I've done a documentary exposing who they are and how they operate. They, this organisation come in, they're like an NGO. Yeah, there's, lots, there's one in each country. There's an organisation like this in each country. Their job is to attack anyone who speaks out. You go against the status quo, you go against immigration, you go against trans, transgenderism, you go against... I realise it's not just because I used to speak against open borders. Whatever section you go against, they come after you. They find out where you work, they go after your family, they contact your family's work, they try and make them lose jobs. Their job is to destroy your life. That's their job, yeah? So we think we've got freedom of speech, but you've got these NGOs. So you don't need the police to be coming after you because these groups come after you. So hope not hate. Their 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 job is constantly to attack me. They what they do is they create. So anyone you fall out with, yeah. If I anyone who I sack in my job, they get into them, and then they pay everyone. They got everyone because they've got all this. George they're funded by George Soros. They got all this money coming in. So they fund someone to say something. They don't care if it's the truth. <coughs> they fund them. This person and then they have all the media lined up ready. This person will make accusations against me, and then the media will pump it around the world. Damage is done. Now Lucy Brown was offered £5,000 by Andrew Gilligan to paint me as a Harvey Weinstein figure. That's what they wanted. They, when, I, when I, she was sacked from working with me, we had a big, big fallout, yeah? They went to her and tried to get her, coerce her, because she was vulnerable at that time. Yeah, she was having a bad time in life and they offered her £5,000. Now she could have done that. She didn't, yeah? But she come to me and she'd been offered £5,000. So she could have painted me as a Harvey Weinstein sexual dominant boss figure that's what they wanted her to do there was no truth in that but that's what they wanted her to do at the same time they wanted her to do that in step panorama panorama this is where it all gets it. panorama are the propaganda machine of the british state yeah they will if you go against the british state they're going to destroy you in their investigative journalism I, that's when my, my documentary i've done called pano drama where i got when when panorama approached lucy brown i got her to wear a secret camera to find out what they were saying lucy brown had a recorded conversation of me and her arguing it was to do with Mohammed Hijab and Ali Dawa, two Muslim men who uh, attended a free speech rally in London and there was a fallout over it between all of us, yeah? Nothing sexual, okay? She says, I've got this fallout and 
John John Sweeney, who's now sacked from Panorama, right? He lost his job over all this. He says, "How angry does he get?" She goes, "He gets angry." She says, "Okay, okay." He's like, "Okay, okay," and she says, "But I get angry as well." He goes, "Yeah, don't worry, we can clip that out. Yeah, we can clip that out." And, he, and then he says, "Right, we can make this into a sexual thing against Tommy Robinson." It's like what? So when I see all this about Andrew Tate, and, I, and a lot of my followers are against Andrew Tate, yeah? A lot of my followers are A, against his conversion, B, against his morality in the way he earned, earned his money. They're against um, the... They, they believe in some of them, all of the hype and allegations. So this is what's going on. I know what the media have done to me. So when I'm seeing what's going on with him, I'm saying, no, you've got to question everything. Because I was nearly Harvey Weinstein, yeah? I was nearly... Uh, they were nearly turning an innocent argument with me and an ex-employee into a sexual thing that was going to be pumped on Panorama. So when I see Vice Media, who recently come out and they've released uh, voice recordings of uh, apparently of Andrew Tate, I question everything. They've released voice recordings of Andrew Tate, which sound absolutely horrific. Now, what they don't tell you, this there was a rape allegation against Andrew Tate in 2015 from the girls who they've got these voice recordings of. What they don't tell you, what Vice Media didn't tell anyone, is that the reason that didn't go to trial was because the two girls who were making the allegations, when you make a sexual allegation, we've seen it with this Ellie Williams case up in Barrow, your phone is taken off you yeah, by the police. The police found that these two girls were conspiring to extort Andrew Tate for money. Yeah? So when he, he was, he, he was a, a boss of 75 women who were paid to take their clothes off on TV, yeah? I don't know what politics or dramas he has being that boss, but these two girls, which the media haven't told anyone, were conspiring, which is why no charges were brought. When you listen to those voice notes, it's like, well, if the voice notes are as you say, yeah, vice media, then the CPS would have prosecuted Andrew Tate. One million percent. Yeah. So I just question everything. And Andrew Tate is blown up. He converted to Islam. I strongly oppose to that, strongly disagree with it. I was actually scheduled to have a podcast with him so we could sit down and discuss everything. Um, but, and you can question his morality and where he's made his money. You can question all those things, but you should also question the media and the level of power that is lodged against him at the minute. I don't think he's going to be seen again. Scary. Like, he does say you get three strikes. One, cancel you. Second, prison, third, dead. Like, it's just scary how fast the, well, if they're the invading, can turn. If they're invading countries to get what they want, if they're throw, overthrowing governments, if they're stealing elections, if they're, lying to, if they're lying to you about all these things in order to get their narrative and their one world view, their one world view needs weak men. They need, they don't need, say you've got men that resist, yeah? What would they rather have? A thousand blue-haired, non-binary, weak little cowards so they can tell them what to do, tell them how to live. And we can get when they're bringing in their 15-mile radius things, I don't know if you've seen what's going on, their plan for the carbon tax. This is where it all, this is the jigsaw I'm talking about, is the carbon, the, the, the climate change and your carbon footprint. And they're just trialing this out now in Oxford. So everything you need will be within 15 minutes. And you have to put in an application to leave your 15-minute zone. And all of this will be done to save the planet. All this bullshit, yeah? You know, you, you'll get, and all of it linked with the digital currency. The digital currency will be linked link with your behavior like it is in China. For example, I can't get a bank account. I have been closed by NatWest, by Barclays, by HSBC, by um, Revolut. Every one of them has closed me down. I cannot open a bank account, yeah? I cannot find anyone to represent me half the time as accountants or anything, yeah? So that's happened to me now before they have their, it all linked up digitally in some little digital thing, digital wallet. Like, so in China, if you step out of line with the communist government, you can't travel, you can't buy food, you can't do this, you can't do anything. And that's how they want it. And, and when, with COVID, when they just give the world money, they just paid everyone to keep them happy, yeah? And everyone just happily... When everyone's getting the money, they were getting thousands of pounds given to them to sit at home. And everyone was sitting at home thinking, most people were like, this is great. Yeah, we don't have to work. We're getting money. And I think AI, techno AI technology says in the future that most people won't have to work. What, what do you think about drag queens reading story times to nursery kids? I think about drag screens and transgenderism. and non You know, you, you hear a lot about non-binary, yeah? You hear a lot about that? Yeah. 0.06% of the British population. 0.06% is non-binary. 0.16% yeah? is pagan. Don't hear nothing about that. Why are you shoving this? And when I say, when, this is where it gets to the corporations again, because you see the he, they, them, I'm a furry, I'm whatever you're saying you are, yeah? And all the big corporations now, you get an email from a big corporation, it has their uh, 
gender. They're there. It has they, he. So this will be filtered down from the Black Rocks and all the big corporations who like to control the world. All the top corporations, all the top businesses, all the top, like the Starbucks, the, the all these top corporations will end up, then their employees will have to wear it on their thing. And then overnight, they've changed it for 0.06% non-binary, transgen transgenderism. And you've got trannies reading story story books. Have you seen them all with their tits out and little kids going up and putting money in them? It's paedophilia. It's it, it, and again, it all comes down to this where you have to feed it all back. What is that about? What is the the drag queen drag queen story time? Is at libraries. It's touring now at libraries in every town city. It's happening now in every town city, and people are bringing their kids to it. Yeah, this is the pollution of identity, pollution of what's a man and woman, the pollution of sexualization of children, the destruction of the family unit. All of it is interlinked. All of this is interlinked. It's trying and to normalise some It's normalising Because they're trying to bring the age of consent down to 16 to 12 as well. Yeah. And they're also... But they have normalised it. And they're talking in Scotland, it's not even paedophilia anymore. It's a sexual attraction to minors. Like, that, it's My, unbelievable. You're like, Scottish. Fucking you're, hell, but that, That's been coming for a couple of years. So what people don't realise... But realize, they're already 10, 20 years ahead anyway. They are. Yeah, yeah. they are with their planning. Yeah. So LGBTQ+, plus, what's the plus? Where are we going? I What I believe now massively is the LGB community need to staunchly separate themselves from this paedophilic sexualization of children because majority of people uh, uh, I, I support the lgb community lesbian gay bisexual you want to be lesbian you want to be gay you want to, you want to have your life i'm happy for you yeah you start bringing these trannies outside schools it's going to deter you your, your rainbow's been stolen i think the rainbow was stolen the first time but it's been stolen again by this sexualization movement of children, yeah? And they're doing it all in your names. So if you're a lesbian, if you're gay, you need to rise up against what's currently happening. Because <clears throat> most lesbian and gay people I speak to are against it as well. <clears throat> but it's been done in their name. And, and and when we say they're 20 years ahead, they are 20 years, there's this minor attracted person. That's, that's, that's how they want to label paedophiles. Because paedophilia, just like 20 years ago, transgenderism would have been insane to people. Like, whoa, now it's normalized. Now they're reading... Now they're reading stories to your kids. Yeah, they're coming in your schools. Yeah, it's it's been normalised that quick. Yeah, the next one is minor attracted people. It's just a sexualization. It's just a it's just a sexual orientation. That's how they want to label it. And if it minor attracted people is just a sexual orientation, then uh, then burying them in the ground is just gardening, buff. So it's in, it's insane. Where it's insane what's coming. And once you know that's what's coming, and you know their goal. And then you see someone, we go back to Andrew Tate, and then someone like Andrew Tate comes along and says, you've got to be strong. They, When COVID started, they didn't open the gyms, tell people to go out and walk and get fresh and be healthy. They give cheap vouchers from McDonald's for takeaways. They want you fat. They want you depressed. They want you reliant on their state. And then, and that's why he has been, that's why he has caused such a problem for them. Because when they thought they deleted him, he blew up bigger. He's going to get bigger if he gets out his game. Yeah, so that's why he can't get out. That's what I think. If he gets out and he's and, and this is all bullshit, because did you watch yesterday? They put out saying that these six women, six women are sl have been slaved and trafficked in Romania. Well, four of those women now come out and give interviews mm -hmm. saying it's lies. We're friends with them. Yeah. So you're lying. Yeah. So if they if he comes out from this, then he's going to go boom through the roof. So that's why I am seriously worried because I think. They ain't gonna let them out from this. And when I say, well, I, I just look at, I, I look at what they've done to me. I was never anywhere near the level Andrew Tate got to. I got big. I got big on social media. I started having influence. I started reaching people and they come from every angle of everywhere. You've seen, I sent you my film Silence. They bankrupt me through lies. They created lies. And um, yeah, they cut there. And with him, that's why with him, do you know what they can't have? They can't have him flaunting it financially so successful. So that's why the organised crime bit comes in. Because if they can just pin anything at the start on raising money or making money for organised crime, they'll take the lot. <coughs> that's what they're going to do. What happened? What was the incident with your kid and the swimming as well, Tommy? You got to jail? Yep. Uh, so the kid, So I was at Centre Parks um, and a man, Gulam, Gulam Nitesh was his name. He, my daughter comes running over to me, says... Dad, dad, some man just grabbed my bottom. <clears throat> I say, okay. And I video it because I, 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 I say, okay, when you say grabbed your bottom, could he have brushed past you by accident? Did he say anything when he grabbed your bottom? Like, did he say sorry? Or she said, no, 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 he just walked off. I said, okay, could he have just accidentally? She said, dad, he grabbed my bottom. 
So I said, okay, come, show, come and show me who, who, who's grabbed your bomb. So we walk over. She says him, as, and it says a man's walking up, and this Asian dude's walking up, and he's walking up with another man who's got a pink swim cap on, yeah, who just looked like, who if you could picture a wrong un, Jimmy King. he looked like a wrong un, yeah? So there's three of them walking up. So I, as he comes up, I said, all right, mate, who are you here with? And my daughter, I told go back to go. I said, go back to your mum. So I'm standing there, I said, who are you here with, mate? And he said, what? I said, who are you here with? And he, he pointed at these two blokes. I said, got any children with you? This is Centre Parks. Got any children with you? No. Any women with you? No. And, I, and I, as I went to say about my daughter, he said, grab the bottom by accident. I went, you fucking what? Yeah. So then, and as, as then I think, well, now I know you've done it. Yeah. Now I know you've done it. As he goes to walk past me, I grab him. He takes a couple of slaps in the process. I hold him down, say to the lifeguard, get the fucking police. Yeah. Get the fucking police here for him. So I'm holding him. Lifeguards come over. They hold him. We wait three hours. So I sit there with my children. I've got, I've got my three children, two of their friends, because I've got a day pass. We was in on a day pass because it's only up at Woburn, just up the road from Luton. We're on a day pass. We're waiting. Managers come, say, what's happened? I say, sexually assault my daughter. Yeah, that man sexually assault my daughter. So get the police. Police come. They take my ex-wife now downstairs with my daughter. They ask her what happened. She clearly tells them what happened. He grabbed my bottom. He'd done this. And um, then they cut, then they come upstairs say they need to see me so I go downstairs I say all right and I'm waiting and they say we're going to be arresting you I'm like okay I said all right I'm thinking well he has took a slap in the process I said okay have you arrested him and then I realized I haven't arrested him I said are you not arresting him I said tell me you're fucking arresting him and there's a bit oh, I start losing my head I said tell me you're arrest just tell let me let me know he's being nicked and I'm coming with you yeah they didn't nick him they nicked me for assaulting him they did not even arrest him. Yeah. So then he's let go. Right? Bearing in mind that he, it, there's three men there. He's at centre parks. They didn't seize their phones. They didn't do anything. So <coughs> he's let go. I go home. I, I get arrested. And my, I get arrested downstairs, not in front of my kids. So my, as my wife said, I said, don't tell children I'm arrested. Tell them I'm helping the police with what's going on. Yeah. So we go home and bearing in mind, I've been in jail a couple of times away from my children. As my daughter's driving home the next day from school, I'm still in the police station. It comes on the radio. Tommy Robinson's arrested. My daughter then breaks down in the car. For me, it's upsetting because my daughter had done everything right. She was sexually assaulted and she come and told someone. Yeah? She then has been made to feel that she, what she's done wrong, which is all I want to know. What you've done was right. Yeah? But now daddy's arrested. Daddy's been prosecuted. Daddy's facing prison. Um, but then from, from that, so what I've done is the original conversation we had at, with my daughter, I, I released it online. People were going mad because you could hear my daughter saying, clearly he grabbed my bum dad. He grabbed it like this. He pinched it like this. So then I ring the police and I say to the police, what's going on? Yeah. And how come he hasn't been arrested? Do you not need to speak to my daughter? Yeah. He's sexually assaulted her. What's going on? And then about two weeks later after this, once they go through it, they get the CCTV. So they look at the CCTV. They see my daughter leg it out of the swim pool. Yeah. And they see him scurry off the other way. Yeah. So then they nick him. Then they nick him. Yeah. It's too fucking late now. Because whatever he had on his mobile phone was with his other two dirty nonce mates at Centre Parks, whatever they had isn't there anymore because you've let them go home and you've nicked me and charged me. He went, <coughs> he got, he then got taken to court. He got prosecuted for sexual assault against my daughter. He gets prosecuted. He goes to court and my daughter has to give evidence. So she has to go and do this video thing, which is, I, can, I, I do actually now understand why some people, you, you're in a balance of do they go through with this? Because it was horrific for my daughter then to be challenged and to go through it. So she goes and does this video evidence. He gets taken to court. They made the, his defense made the whole thing about her dad, about Tommy Robinson. It was at a jury in Luton. <coughs> it was all about Tommy Robinson. The CPS woman said to my wife afterwards, he got a hung jury. The CPS woman said, I do not know how he got a hung jury. Because he, he says in his statement that he banged his head yeah, on the, on the slide. He banged his head on the slide. He was disorientated and he was grabbing for the side yeah, of the pool. This is what his statement says. Right? He sexually assaulted my daughter. He got away with it. Right? He sexually assaulted my daughter. Not just to get away with it, but I got prosecuted. I got charged. I got taken to court. I was, I was given 200 hours community service for it. 200 hours community service for slapping the paedophile. 
Does that then become frustrating in your life because obviously no matter well, if you my, do my right children are not protected by the law because of me. That things are treated differently because of me. I've seen things. I've seen my son. Uh, my son just started a new school recently. Got really loving he, his first two weeks. He was so happy. Yeah, and then boom, um, in the parents WhatsApp group, they'd become parent. It's my son, and they'd said they need to protect to protect their children. And my son was isolated overnight. And then he then he's crying his eyes out at the time and doesn't want to go to school and he's unhappy and he's been isolated. And I think I've what I've watched when my when my son was five years old with thirty kids in the class and twenty nine get invited to a party. I've seen it. So then I, that that's been a struggle for me because I sit and think, well, I, it's me, it's my politics, it's what I've said, what I've done that's put my children in these positions. Yeah, that's the hard thing. Like, oh, man, obviously, I seen the stress on you three years ago when you were talking about stuff like that. It doesn't just affect you; it affects everybody around you. For, but and I'll state this here, and I'll state it on the podcast. The majority of stuff you do, I will back and agree with. Look, like, yeah. because when you're talking about when it comes to kids, I'll back that all day long. It's not like, even just kids. And that's your daughter. It's the same as Sarah San. She's done the right thing. It's to protect her, to protect her kids. Any mother or father. If you can't protect your kids, then you ain't a mother or a father. That's the, the, the one thing you've got to well, do. Well, no, to protect them. Now. Is to protect them. But all the shit that you've done in the past, it obviously is always going to come bite, bite your ass. No matter if you do good, wrong, yeah. become a saint, you're always going to be judged as well for, from the past. Like, even when you're in prison, Tommy, see when you were doing, like, when you had all your Osmonds, threats to life, like, how were you treated in prison? So the last case, I went to Belmarsh. No, so I've had some disastrous prison sentences. If uh, Where do we start? Um, I lost my ticket. I was in Woodhill. I got, I got, I went to Woodhill for a, a mortgage fraud charge. So basically, when I started the English Defence League, this is what they're doing now with Tate. When I started the English Defence League, they come in. Yeah. When I say they come in, they they closed your accounts, Dad. Your bank accounts got closed. Your business accounts. They done. They went back five years on my mum, my dad, my whole family. Yeah. They went through everyone, and they're trying to find things to nick anyone on. So then they started raiding, nicking everyone. I got nicked on. Um, they nicked my wife at the time. Uh, tax evasion. They tried me on tax evasion. I got a not guilty. They nicked mortgage fraud. So basically, the story was that um, at the time between me and my wife, we had seven mortgages, all fully legit. Now, do you remember self certification mortgages? Yeah. So. They used to say, if you put down a 20% deposit, you don't have to, you can then self-certify how much you earn. My, my wife's little brother had said, and he was an apprentice for my company, Plumbing, said he earned 20,000 when he earned 12. So he got a fraudulent mortgage in their eyes. He bought a house. He'd done the house up. It was his first property. And then he sold it. Yeah. Four years after, so the house is sold. The mortgage company had paid back. Four years later, they bought all our doors off. I go, I got 18 months for that. I got 18 months for him buying that house. And, and, and you know, so he bought the house for, say, 60 grand, yeah? Sells the house for 100, no, bought the house for 80 grand, 20 grand deposit. Sells the house for 125 when it was all done up. The police hit me for 125,000 pound confiscation order. I had to pay him 125 grand. It's like, there was no crime. There was no financial loss to anyone, yeah? But at that time, so I'm in for a little paper offence. I get 18 months and I end up in Woodhill Prison. Um, and I ended up in Woodhill Prison with, there was a case just before that where six Muslims were sentenced to 30 years. They were caught with guns and bombs on the way to kill us. It was in Dewsbury. They, they got there two hours late. It's a comedy sketch, yeah? So there's a video of these six clowns, beardy, weirdy, absolute morons, walking across a car park. And it's the car park that we were in two hours before, yeah? And then they're driving home and they've got no insurance. So then they get pulled over for no insurance. It's actually, you should, it could actually do a proper comedy sketch. So they get pulled over for no insurance. Police don't search the boot of the car. The police nick, the police seize the car, put it in a compound. Two days later, the people in the compound open the boot of the car. Guns, suicide vests, bombs, IEDs, everything is in the boot, yeah? They come up to kill us. So then the police come to see me, let me know, look, they, they come to see me and said, people have been trying to track you through, through your mobile phone. They're, so they must have had access into someone in the network who was trying to get a location for where I was, apparently. Yeah. So that's what police come to see me about. I said, okay, so these six men are prosecuted. I go to their court trial. They're given 25 to 30 years. I stand up at the end of the court. As they got their 25 to 30 years, I was there with my cousin Kev. So we're on the back row. They had about 17 people, 16, 17 people in front of us, all, all big religious figures, big beards. And then there's the six of them awaiting their sentencing. And um, it's funny because they were looking at porn and that, yeah? Because they're going through all the court. So I sat for the whole court case and they're not meant to be looking at porn. 
all this haram stuff is coming up on this one dude's phone and they're and I, I, they're all laugh, all his mates are laughing at that while they're on trial for this what, what would have been a hurry it would have launched I believe if that happened at that time when, at the height of the English Defence League we've, we'd have had a conflict on the streets and it was, would probably still be going if six Muslims would have entered an English Defence League demonstration and murdered and blown up people I believe it would become a tip for tat war that would have launched so we're lucky that never happened at those times but they get they get 30 years I stand that as they get sentenced I say I I shout, I scream, God save the queen. The whole court erupts. They're all coming at us from behind. The whole court erupts anyway. Six months later, I do this mortgage case. I land in Woodhill Prison and I, get, I go for a meeting with my legal team and I sit down. I look across. Boom, boom, boom. It's all them. It's all them. <laughs> I was just like, oh, bro. Bro, man. I'm, I, I was shitting myself. Well, I thought, these, these are killers. They, they're like, they're doing 30 years. They're not bothered. They're terrorists. And then, and this is in a Woodhill Prison sentence where, I went, I had a, a, a prison officer come to my door, screw, a screw come to my door and he said, when they come to get you, do not leave this cell. Ex-paratrooper he was. He said, do not leave this cell. I said, what? He said, your life depends on it. Don't leave this cell. I said, okay. So an hour later, however long later, he knocks on the door with two other screws. He said, come on, you're going on A-Wing. I said, I ain't going nowhere, bruv. He said, if, if, if and he, he led me. If you refuse to go, you're going to get a nick in. You're going to be given. I said, okay, well, I'm refusing to go. He said, okay, well, you go, you'll go before the governor then. So then I got penalised as they take your TV out of your cell and you get, you get done. And then A-Wing, where they were taking me, there's no cameras on the wing, they were taking me to where, them were, where they were. Why? To kill yeah. you? Yeah, I'd have been killed. He, he, said, he said the woman, he gave me the woman's name who was, who was making the decision. He said, she'll get done for corporate manslaughter here. Yeah? He goes, but too late, you're going to be dead. Yeah, you'd have been dead. So then this happened. So the next day, I go for a meeting with my legal team again. Yeah, Because I'm going through, I, think I was trying to do appeal. I go for a meeting with my legal team. I come back after the meeting, I'm getting walked down. There's a room the size of this lounge. Door opens, it's the waiting room. Door opens, so I just walk in, I see beards. So I just look and think, oh, fucking hell, man. And I didn't even sit down, because I just stood my back to the, put my back to the wall. Prison officers locked the door and boom, I lost my teeth. I got battered. Even, I, I, they all rushed me. There's three of them. The sickening thing, so when I landed on the first night centre, I didn't ever go on protection in jail. Yeah? So I landed on the first night centre and I come out and there's Muslims in there. I said, do you know who I am? To this young Muslim. I said, I haven't got a problem with you, yeah? But if anyone wants to have a problem with me, I'm more than happy to have a straight up problem. Yeah? Don't, I don't want those slimy shit yeah? or, or, or snaky shit. So I haven't got a problem with you. Let me make that clear. Yeah? But if you know who I am and, you want it, and there is a problem, just let me know. Yeah? He said, I've got no problem, brother. I said, okay, cool. Yeah? Yeah, fucking, when I'm getting rushed in the cell, when I'm getting rushed in the waiting room, as I come round after, I'm, I'm swinging out fighting, holding on to one of them, I get battered. As I come out, it's him. One of them's him. I said, you little rat, <laughs> you little rat, but my teeth are missing, I'm battered. And then, I, and then, and then I'm, what, what felt like 10 minutes was probably 60 seconds. But I knew by the look on their faces as well, they didn't know I was coming in that room. So when they opened that door, I saw them look and I thought, and I, I looked at them and I saw them look, like they're all looking at each other thinking, Tom Robson's just getting put in our room. So they done what they done. And, um, and, then I, and then I got shipped. So then I got put down the block. I see the governor um, and then I got transferred to Winchester prison. But each of my prison centres, so that's, that, that happened in Onley, that happened, that happened in Woodhill. Um, and then I was, went down to Winchester Prison and I had a great prison sentence in Winchester Prison. Do you know why? Because there's not enough Muslims in there to do anything, if I'm honest. And they didn't have the complete control of that jail. They have complete control of most jails. I went into Wood, I went into Wood, there's an episode on 25,000 police custody. I'm in Peterborough Prison. I'm on a 12-day licence recall. It was to prevent me stop, stop talking at Oxford University. So I was due to talk at Oxford University. Please come and grab me. Stuck me in jail on recall to miss the date. So I was, I was on recall. And when I landed at Peterborough Prison, I said to them, I said, you know who I am? I'm here. I'm, I'm out in 12 days. You know what's going to happen out there, yeah? I'm happy. Just lock my door. Let me out in a week. Let me out, yeah? And they said, oh, do you want to go on protection? I said, no, I don't want to go on protection. I'm not going on protection, yeah? Okay, you're going on B-Wing. So I said, all right, I'll go and be with And my, my instinct, I, I know I've, I've done what I've had to do in previous pr prison centres, we'll get on to Bedford, to survive, yeah? So I'm sitting there, I'll go on to, I'll go on to B Wing, and my instinct would be protect yourself, protect yourself straight away, yeah? Anyone comes near you, protect yourself. And I remember walking, I was going upstairs, and I remember looking, there was a few, few Muslims on the wing, there was four Muslims from Bedford, they got 20 years, they cut someone's ears and nose off, like a famous thing near where I live. And my head was telling me, boot him. My head, that's what my head was telling me, yeah? My head, and I was thinking, I'm out in 12 days, yeah? I just need to get through these 12 days. I don't need it any longer. So I didn't do anything. I just thought, get through the 12 days. 
And every time my cell door opened, I'd come out of my cell and I'd stand my back to the wall downstairs. So I'm thinking, I have to be ready. Someone's going to come for me at some point. I've got to be ready. And I can't get caught lacking in my cell because that's where they'll get you and, you and you'll be gone. So then I come out. So my cell comes out and no, no one has my back in there yeah, because there's too many Muslims. So I come out and on 20,000 police custody, I'm standing there and some white boy comes up to me and he says, Tommy, you're going to get done with boiling water. Yeah. I said, who's going to do me with boiling water? And he says, um, and he, he says, whatever cell number. He says, look over. And I looked over and there's a Somalian kid and there's the boy from Bedford. Yeah. And they're talking at the door of another cell. And he goes, mate, the amount of money they've put up for, for you to get done, it might not even be a Muslim that does you. I said, all right. And he, uh, and he goes, but the Somalian kid's going to do you with the boiling water. So I said, all right, sound. So I walk straight over and fill the Somalian kid in before he has a chance to even look. I, I said, which one? And he says, him at the door. So I said, okay. So I go over and I fill him in. And then, um, and then all the screws break it up. And then I go before the governor and I say, mate, he's going to do me boiling water. I'm not waiting to get boiling. They put him in jail, you know, they get boiling water, you put sugar, sugar. in it, sticks to your face, you're gone. Your face is gone. I'm not waiting for that. Yeah. So I go over, I fill him in. And when I fill him in, you can see me on, you can see me on the footage and I've got my arms open and the, the imam's there. Yeah. I've got my arms open. And what I was saying, I said, is, any, is there anyone else who, 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 who wants to do it? So, but then I get nicked. Then I get nicked in the jail. Go before the governor and I say, mate, I told you lot. When I landed in this jail, I told you my life's in danger. You decided to stick me on a wing full of Muslims who were up for 25 years and that. Yeah? You decided that. They wanted to do me a boiling water. I protected myself. So nothing happened in jail. I, go, I come out of jail. I go on holiday with my kids for two weeks. I land at Luton Airport. I'm nicked for a racially aggravated attack in jail. And then they, I stand Crown Court trial. They, they, but they were forced. This was the first time I ever had good legal representation. So they, I got not guilty. They were forced, but they, they, the actual, my, my defence forced the prosecution to basically pull their case because when they went through all the stuff, it showed from the records from when I got to the jail what I'd said, but they didn't release it to my prosecution or something. So they were hiding the fact that the prison knew I was in danger. They knew I shouldn't be where I was. They put me there. Yeah. But anyway, so that was, that was Bedford, that was Peterborough. Um, where else have I been? Bedford. I mean, like the, when I, went, I, went, I got to Bedford prison, but you know, rival gangs, yeah. when they've got a rival gang from a different postcode, you're not allowed to be on the same wing in jail. Yeah. You've got Tommy Robinson, right? Who's the rival gang? <laughs> it's Islam. It's, it's, it's all followers of Muslim, uh, of Islam. So I land at, at Bedford prison. It's my local jail. I forget what I was doing on this case. I've done, I've been in 10 prisons and when I, all oh, because of this politics. And, and, and when I landed there, I looked at the receptionist, said, you've got a brother called Mark. And he said, yeah, I knew, I knew his brother. I knew straight away from the face because my local jail. I said, I know your brother. He goes, yeah, I know. I said, mate, um, find out. And then we were going through where the most Muslims are. Most Muslims are on A-wing. It's the biggest wing in Bedford. And you usually go straight on induction wing when you go to that prison. And I was asking, mate, I said, is Jason in here? Is, is Johnny in here? I was asking mates I've grown up with, finding out where I've got friends to try and get with some of them. So we established some of my friends were on B-wing. There was a few Muslims. There was a famous, another case where the Somalians, there was a big case where they got shot dead in Milton Keynes, all Somalian gangs. And they were all in on A-wing. So he comes back and then he, he goes, I'm gonna, I've got to go up and see the governor. So he comes up, he comes downstairs. He goes, sorry, Tommy, man. I said, what? He said, you're going on A-wing or you can go on the numbers. Protection. I said, I'm not going on the numbers, bruv. I said, I ain't got, I have done nothing wrong to go and be housed with paedophiles. It's not happening. He goes, yeah, you're going on A-wing then. And I, he goes, so I think they were thinking I'd, I'd choose the numbers. So I said, give me a pen and paper. So he gives me a pen and paper. So I write six pages detailing the threats I've had from terrorist groups, from Osman warnings, the gangs that are in there locally to me. I know the names of the gangs, the, the Pakistani gangs. I list it all. I say, your job is to keep me safe as a governor of this jail. Yeah, you have a, you have a duty to keep me safe. You know, these people will want to cause me harm. So I, I, I think he's going to read that. Now that's on file. Yeah, he's never going to make me go on A-wing. So I'm sitting there, he comes back down, he goes, you're going on A-Wing. I said, all right, that's the sound. And as we're walking onto A-Wing, I said, are you ready, boys, to the two screws? And he goes, what? I goes, watch what I fucking do when I get on here, man. And then we're walking on. And as I walked on, I mean, you know, like you're walking on, you've got all the landings. And they're all howling, cheering, yeah, as I'm walking in. And I'm walking in, and I'll be honest, I'm shitting myself, yeah. I'm thinking, fuck, man. Like I, didn't, I didn't think they'd be able to do this, yeah, in my local jail, just bring me to them. So they bring me up, it's 10 to 12, they put me in my cell, lunch is at 12 o'clock, so the workers are obviously out, the, the, pris the, the, the prisoners who have got jobs are obviously all out. The word's gone round, 
I go straight to my cell window and I said, your fucking paedophile would be on the D-wing. The D-wing is the paedophile ring, yeah? So I said, yeah. And I start, I start giving it through the windows because I know I, it's a, it's, I'm doing a, protect, a protection mechanism here because I can't wait for them to get me in my cell. So I go up and I'm arguing with everyone and they say, you're dead. I said, I've heard that for six years. I've had two black eyes, you shit houses, yeah? I said, like, I said, everyone agrees with me because everyone, I said, everyone, you're bullies. Everyone agrees with me. I said, all the white and black boys will come to my cell and they give me thumbs up because this happens in every jail, yeah? They'll all secretly give me the thumbs up. Because you lot of fucking bullies, the way you act in these jails, and I'm having all this through the windows, <laughs> and they were like, you're dead, you're dead. And I remember hearing some black goobers laughing, saying, who the fuck is this geezer? And I was like, and, they, and, they, and I was like, I'm on the wing, you mugs, yeah, I'm on a, and then I'm, and then but I know when that door opens, I'm getting out of that wing, I'm getting out of that cell. So the door opens for, for lunch, I go flying out of the cell, I go straight down into canteen, I walk in, I say, who's fucking Muslim? Yeah, D and Dion, Dion, a uh, little gangbanger from Luton, who I got a lot of respect for. His brother, I knew his sister. I actually like him. He's converted to Islam, so he's like, "Yeah, actually, I'm Muslim, bruv." I'm like, "Oh man," and I'm I'm needing to kick this off because I'm otherwise I'm getting it. Yeah, so I'm the, so I'm like Dion, and then a white boy next to him goes, "Yeah, I'm fucking Muslim," and I don't know the white boy, so boom, I'm grabbed him. I'm fighting with him. All the screws have come, broke it up. I'm in such an adrenaline rush. But then, and then I, as they pulled me out, I see another black boy, Wesley Barker. He's got a big beard. I said, you bruv, because, and I know it. He goes, actually, man, I'm not, because I'm thinking everyone's Muslim now and everyone here's, everyone's on me. And then as I, and then they dragged me up to the cell and I'm drenched in the, it's the biggest adrenaline rush. That moment was, the, and, and, and they put me in my cell and they locked the door. And I remember just screaming, because ah! I thought, I thought I was dead. I thought I was dead. And then I was screaming. But in that moment, in that time, that's a fight for my life because if that doesn't happen, when that happens, I'm down. So then I get nicked and you get a punishment. You're in isolation. So oh, yeah, I've done that to get isolated. Yeah, I had to. I'm not asking for protection, but when you do that, you get put on 23 and a half, 23 and a half hour bang up in the, in the basement of the jail. So I'm then taken down to the basement of the jail. But before that, I'm shouting out the windows like, like cause I was, I was like, I thought I was dead lads. And I get locked. Then I'm down in the basement of the jail and then they bring McDonald. The boy's name was McDonald. I didn't know who he was. When I hit him, he had a big beard. And as he comes through, I'm, he's in the cell next to me. And then they brought my other mate, who I know from outside. He's in the cell next to me because he smashed up his cell before court or something. So we're all talking in the cells. And then his, this Muslim lad's trying to quash it. Going, you actually, man, like, fucking what the fuck? And I'm like, why are you trying to quash it? And then and as they brought him out, I looked through, I said, McDonald. Like, I knew him and his brother. I said, you motherfucker, man. He goes, and he goes, you actually, you're, and I said, you converted. And, he, and he, he's like, and, uh, and then and he was trying to question because he knows who I am. I know him. I, he goes, knows when I get out. I'll know him. I'm moving the same circles as him. And he was like, what the fuck, bruv? I said, bruv, I've got to survive this, man. I've got to, and then the priest come in and started on me. The priest literally started on me. What did the priest come in and goes, you think you're fucking clever? I went, you what? And because I refused food again, I, I said, I'm not eating anything that's halal. So yeah, I want chicken that's on the menu, but I want non-halal chicken. I'm just being a little prick, I was, yeah. But I said, I want non-halal chicken. So get me some non-halal chicken. And then they can't get you non-halal chicken. I said, well, how come I don't get a choice? And I'm, I'm just, why, by this point, I think, yeah, I'm going to cause mayhem in here now, yeah. I'm going to cause mayhem. And I'm arguing and all the travellers are on my side. And they're going, yeah, what are you? And I say, Catholic, because I know what's coming. Yeah, yeah, fucking paedophile. said, I can hear the travellers going, well, what? And then, so the whole place is erupting, man. I'm thinking, what are they going to do? Yeah, because the whole, I mean, the whole jail is erupting now. It's all going. And then my mate comes back from, and my mate's shouting from the cells upstairs saying, I've got his back and all hell's going off. The priest comes in and says, you think you're clever, don't you? I know what you've done. I said, what do you mean? He goes, you fucking, you, you've done this to get, to, get, to, get, to get down here. I said, yeah, of course I fucking have. What do you mean? But he literally, the attitude he had with me, I said, how many people are you actually listen to you? Because everyone in here is converting, bruv. Oh, I just got really wound up. It was a local priest. And then, uh, and then I thought, what are they going to do? Well, how are they going to deal with this? And at about six o'clock in the morning, the next morning, they come in, security. I've got ACAD to uh, Woodhill. Did you ever think they would poison your food or anything? Yeah, I didn't eat, did I? So when I went, when I, when I went to Onley, so when I went into Onley on the... When I went to, into Onley Prison, I got arrested for the contempt charge in Hull, which were in Leeds, where I asked the Muslim, how are you feeling about your verdict on his way into court? They took me in on the contempt charge. They put me in Hull Prison where there's not many Muslims. I was fine. They put me on healthcare wing. So I refused protection. They put me on the healthcare wing. So I'm in the hospital wing. People who are in there for hospital. So I was sound. I was probably in there for about 10 days. 
-hmm. And then uh, I thought, this is all right. Yeah, I'm safe. There's no risk. I can deal with this. This is all right. And then, because um, every other jail, I've had to fight my way through it. So I thought, I'm safe. And then they come in the morning and they said, you're getting transferred. I said, where? And they goes, we can't tell you. We'll tell you when you get in the car. So then I'm thinking, am I going to kick off? So I'm thinking, well, if you sort of sank out for me, now, you're not just going to transfer me. Have you sorted something out? And they said, yeah, it's all been sorted. You get transferred. So I get in the car. So where am I going? They said, Only. I said, Only. And Only's got the highest percent of Muslims of any CCAP prison in the country, yeah? So as I'm on the way there, I'm thinking, well, something's got to be sorted, man. They must, they must have some unit in Only that I'm going to go to in Only. So I land in Only. And I go before the governor and he goes, well, I think you know what's going to happen here, don't you? I said, yeah, I do. Well, you do, didn't you? He goes, well, you're going to be in danger, aren't you? I said, yeah. He said, you're going to have to isolate yourself then, aren't you? I said, what do you mean isolate myself? We're well, going to have to self-isolate, which means you're going to have to want your door locked all the time. And I'm such a, and maybe I should have just said, yeah. Right? But I said, no. I said, where are you putting me? And he said, we're putting on this wing. I said, well, you open the door, I'm coming out of it. And then he goes, we're well, going to get her. I goes, someone's going to get her. Yeah? I said, but you bought me here. I was fine where I just was. You've brought me in. So then, they, then he goes, well, you're going down the block. I said, what am I going down the block for? He go, so the block's where you go for punishment. Down the block, you're on 23 and a half hour lockup. You get, you've got a little blue mat. That's it. And there's no TV. There's no electric in there. You just, it's where people go, stab people, do mad things in jail. You end up down the block. So he said, you're going down the block. So I think, what the fuck am I going down the block for? You've, I haven't done anything wrong here. Yeah, you've brought me here. You're asking if I'll self-isolate. I'm saying no. Yeah? Why would I self-isolate myself? Lock myself up for like if, if the door opens, I'm coming out of it. Yeah? Give me a job. Do what everyone else does. You brought me here. Yeah? And you can deal with the problems that come from it. So then he puts me down the block. I'm taken down the block. So I'm in the block. So then I say, well, I ain't eating or drinking yeah? at all. And the reason being that my food would come to me in a little box and it says Yaxley Lennon on it. Yeah. So the lads that deliver the food or the people working the servery, the best job in jail is servery. The Muslims run the jail. They've got all the best jobs. They control everything. So my food's getting delivered to me. You actually learn, you can get anything you want in jail, smuggled in, yeah? Anything you want. It wouldn't be hard to get rat poison. It wouldn't be hard to poison my food. So I'd sit there and think, well, and the, but the, the reason was the World Cup starting in a week. I wasn't there for the World Cup. I ain't got a TV. All I was thinking is, well, I'm in jail. Get, get a TV. I'll watch the World Cup. Yeah. So it puts me down the block in on Lee. And I say, well, I ain't eating or drinking until you give me a TV. He said, we can't have a TV. There's no, there's no sockets in here. I said, What's the, I didn't put me here. You put me here. Why am I being punished with no TV? So this is going on. So I say, I'm not eating or drinking at all. Yeah. And then I'm talking to the other lads in the cells. And this is where it gets so sad. You've got a prison governor on next in you. Mm -hmm. Ask him about spice. Yeah. So this boy in the cell next door. And I used to get, you get 30 minutes a day. So my 30 minutes, I'd come out of my cell, I'd get put out and there's li like a courtyard. There's all the cells and they all look in on this courtyard and I'd literally preach. I think the first day I walked out, I said, Islam is the cancer, I am the cure. Yeah. And it's my half hour. So, and then I'd be debating and in the end, becoming friendly with some of the Muslim lads, having a laugh with them in, in, in the thing. Yeah. But saying, lads, ask your imam this, ask your imam that. I'll be going through and dissecting all the stuff. So when, they, when the imam would come, they'd obviously be asking him about the age of Aisha. Stuff they don't tell you when you convert. I said, oh, you just, they just convert you. You don't even know who you converted to. Then the imam come, he goes, can you stop, please, Tommy? Stop. I said, stop what? Tell them the truth. Stop educating them. No, I won't stop. I won't stop. But I refused to eat. But what they didn't know, so every time the food comes to my door, I said, fuck off. I'm not eating that. Yeah. I'm not eating anything. Don't bring me any food. Don't bring me any drink. I'm not eating. Yeah. And I'm going to end up collapsing. And when I collapse, I'm going to end up in hospital. And then it's on your prison. Yeah. Because you've done this to me. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. But the lad next door, this boy's next door, he's been down there two months. And what he's done is, he's getting out in, he's, he's getting out in about eight weeks. But he's hooked on spice. He come into jail, not a drug addict. Now he's a drug addict. And he's cancelled all his visits because he don't want anyone to see him in the state he is. So he smashed up his cell so he can get isolated so that he's not near drugs. This is what the kids had to do. He's sitting on 23 and a half hour bang up on a blue mat with nothing voluntarily. Yeah, He don't want to come out of that room because when he gets freed in eight weeks, he wants to be a bit normal. He doesn't want to be hooked on drugs. This is what he's done. So he's in there. I'm talking to him, the boy next door. And, and we have a shower at the same time. So he's... But I'd go in the shower and he'd pass me under his cereal. He'd pass me under his apple, yeah? So I would be eating, but the prison don't think I'm eating anything, yeah? So I'm in there and I'm, I'm getting my stuff and each day I'm going back 
And then on, on the seventh day, he, he calls me in. The governor calls me in. He goes, right, sign this. I said, what's this? And it was saying that you will be relocated on the wing, um, but you will not be allowed out of your cell. You will still be taken down to... The, and it was, it was that I was doing, doing it voluntary. I said, no, I'm not signing that. Yeah. I'm not doing this. Yeah. You fucking done this. All right. So put me back in the cell. And then they take me back in the cell. And then 10 minutes later, they bring me back in. They said, okay, we've reworded it. We are forcing you. Yeah. But we're going to put you on the wing with a TV. Yeah. Will you eat if we give you, a, if you, if this happens? So I'm looking, thinking England are playing tonight. Yeah. So I, I said, what time? <laughs> when is this? If I sign this, when is this going to happen? Is it going to happen before the football? He said, yes, it's going to happen before the football. I said, I fucking signed it. <laughs> so he, he, he signed it. Then what they've done is, so bearing in mind, my missus, my missus worked at a school at the time. So I'm in only prison. So I've done a week. I've done a week laying in this shitty cell. They then bring me up on the wing. But the deal is I'm not allowed out. So the cell's locked. So I'm on the wing, cell's locked. So people can come to my cell. I'm getting shit, proof, 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 like literally human shit, feces. Uh, feces put through my window. I've got them all at my window kicking off. I'm thinking... I was fine in whole. Who made this decision to bring me here? And what was the fucking purpose of it? Yeah. And I, and I thought, so, and I still wouldn't eat the meals I said, until I got my money. So I got my money on my canteen and I bought tuna. So I had, I could afford seven tins of tuna for the week. Yeah. So that's all I had. I had one tin of tuna a day. That was it. And then water. That's why I lost 30 pounds. I come out looking like a crackhead. Yeah. But I was, um, and I was in there and, and, and for half hour a day, I'd, they'd bring me down from there. They'd bring me down to the block again for my exercise. That's where I'd have my exercise. That's where I'd have my shower. But, and that's when I could have my phone call, which was at lunchtime during the day. My kids are at school and my wife works at school. So I literally couldn't ring anyone. Couldn't speak to anyone. I mean, 23 and a half hour bang up. It, it, I didn't, it, 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 they knocked on my door. Then the screws come to my door one time and said, where's your wife? I'm laying in this cell. I'm like, what? And they said, where's your wife? I said, how the fuck am I meant to know where my wife is? Yeah? I'm banged up in here. I don't even get to use the phone at night. So they said, okay, well, there's intelligence that your wife's going to be attacked with acid. I'm like, what? And they said, yeah, they said, we need to know where she is. And then they just shut the door. I'm like, bruv. Like, it was not until Saturday then. Or the, then I get to ring my wife and the police have knocked on her door and they've given her intel and my mum's that there's going to be an acid attack against them and then what they leave them with is some little bit of paperwork that tells them what to do if you're attacked with acid but then the, the deep thing is and I question was there that plan to do that to my wife or was that all to fry my head because it worked I come out of that prison you can watch a there's a video where I come out and I watched one recently of that night I went on Tucker Carlson I was ill I was sick seriously sick like, I was a mess it took me it still probably is taking it. It's, it took its toll on me, that sentence. See uh, everything you've been through, see, because you're divorced now, Tom, is, yeah. is that a mutual agreement or is it the stresses you put everybody around you under as well with the life that you led? So I, I put my wife, I put my dad's here, my mum, I put them through some mad. You know when I've done my Telford documentaries yeah. recently on the rape of Britain? I had them all turned off my mum's house looking for me. I had, um, I've had my mum's house, their, their house got smashed to bits. Yeah, I've had my car, my wife's car got blown up. So yeah, I've caused massive problems. I was given ultimatums in the early years, stop this activism. I can't, like I believe in it. But I put my wife, and then it, it was a bit of a, it was a mutual agreement because there was a time come when people were sent to my family's house, Antifa activists, again, you've seen it on that documentary, yeah? yeah. Threatens to kill my kids, doesn't get arrested. That was the final straw for my wife. She said, enough's enough, man, because she can't have the kids je jeopardised like this and their safety, So, which I agree. So that, that happened. I, I position myself out of the country now, and I come back in. So how does that feel, like losing everybody who stood by you and loves you more than anything, but your stubbornness and your, <laughs> your grit to try to make change? Like how does it then, how do you then play, how does that play on your mind? Like I just keep saying, through sacrifice comes success. Through sacrifice comes success through sacrifice comes success so where are we now we're in a different global position than we were four or five years ago yeah people who hated me those years ago who are questioning everything since covid questioning everything since the vaccine they're all questioning everything since ukraine since all these things i see a lot more support now for what i say than they're what there was because more people see the media lie more people see that the government aren't our friends that they aren't doing what's best interest for us more people see that so um look my 
I think my ch my children will grow up and read about their dad or hear about their dad properly, and uh, they understand now. I have, I have an amazingly close relationship with my, even now with my ex-wife and my children. I seen the dinner she gave you; it was fucking terrible. Oh, she's, probably <laughs> done, she's probably done you a favour leaving you, mate. She's doing like that. We You're like better that. off in the fucking jail, mate. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? It was seven. It was seven. Did you see? She's working with the governor, mate, giving you meals like that. <laughs> that was fucking terrible. <laughs> I can't even tell me and that's the reason why they're not married. <laughs> oh, mate. Oh, she'll love this. <laughs> sorry, Jenna. I'm sorry, yeah. You're famous as a shit cook <laughs> a great wife ex-wife but a shit yeah. cook an amazing mother do you know what I always say to her I say you you because my she is an amazing mum I never have to worry Yeah, some of my mates are constantly worrying battling with their missus who's going out on, on the gear going out on the sesh she's doing this she's doing that they're always worrying about her. I never had a worry with my wife she just wants to be a mum so that was the problem she just wants to be a mum she wants us to be a family and then there's me and then there was my politics so I always say, well, I wouldn't be able to just go sit in jail for six months at a time if if you weren't such a great mum because I can sit there comfortably because I know mm -hmm. that kids are all right. Yeah. But um, I say, and I, I try and say it to my kids, I say like, do you know what? I, I, whether this is right or wrong, when I was going back to court for the contempt charge, I was at the Old Bailey and I said I was offered a deal by the state to plead guilty and apologise and I, I, won't, I wouldn't go back to prison. Oh, okay. <laughs> Think about my son now. And my, yeah. yeah. And my son said, um, my son said, Dad, just please, just please, Dad, please. I said, I can't, man. And uh, I said, whether that's right putting on his, his head as well. I said, if I ask you one question, son, your sister, she was 12 at the time, there's girls your sister's age who are being kidnapped and tortured. Yeah, they're getting abused in a bad way. I said, if I say no to them now, this is going to blow up again. If it blows up, more people are looking at this and listening to this issue. Yeah, I said, if that saves one girl like your sister, one, just like your sister, yeah, what should I do? And he said, he said, yeah, Dad, he gets you right. So they get, I think I was just trying to get permission off him, but explaining it to him in a way that he understood it. That, and I think, and he does understand it now, and he sees it. Remember, my kids travel around everywhere with me, so they only see me get really a positive reaction from. Many people, they've grown up with me knowing that many of my friends aren't white. They know my stance on racism. They know my stance on Muslims. I've sat and introduced them. Sully, one of my best mates, he's a Kenyan Muslim. So I, I, I introduced at a very early age. I said, son, you're going to hear things. And my daughters, you're going to hear things about me. Yeah, You're going to hear people say things. You know my relationship with Sully. You know I love Sully. You know Sully's a Muslim. You know that. So you know I don't have an embedded problem with him. And he said, yeah. I said, but I do talk about Islam. So I, I've educated my kids in a way to say, because you, you can criticise a religion. You can and you should, yeah, without hating its followers. So I've done that. And But I, I also know that my kids and have been put in some terrible positions. Yeah. Let's talk about the the Ellie Williams scandal. <laughs> like you, a lot of people say you're racist, this and that, but you're supporting the Muslim kids who were wrongly convicted of... Yeah. So, so basically, the Ellie Williams story is that she's put up online saying, I've been groomed by Pakistani Muslim businesses in this town. They've raped me, they've beat me, and she's got these horrific injuries. So I travel to Barrow. I do investigative journalism like I've done in Telford, yes. I travel to Barrow. I obviously have, which I would admit, originally I have a bias where it's Muslim men who have raped a young girl. This fits into the narrative of the story I talk about. She's been beaten and failed by the police. Let's get to Barrow, yeah? And I get up to Barrow, and my job is to investigate what's going on. So I start searching around the town, asking questions about Ellie. I meet a, a young boy, Jordan, who was falsely accused by Ellie. He wasn't just falsely accused, she set him up. She created a Snapchat profile in his name on her phone, and she messaged herself lots of things. She injured herself, and she rang the police laying on the floor. Please come round. What's happened? Jordan Trengrove just raped me. He's arrested, given bail. She then says he's done it again, twice. He gets remanded into jail. So I meet Jordan. He's released from jail because there was no evidence. He didn't do it. I meet him and straight away, so I'm like, hold on. So I look at this. I think, well, at the minute, there's 2,000 people in the car parking cars because it's dark COVID. This town's about to blow up. Yeah. I need to find the Muslim men. So... I then went and found the Muslim men. So I, I, I'm waiting by the ice cream van and this woman says, well, what the fuck do you want? And it's the wife of, of one of these Muslims. I said, I'm just here. I just want to get to the truth. Yeah? 
I don't care if the truth isn't what I thought it was. I don't care if it goes against my narrative. I just want to get to the truth. I want to speak to your husband. She said, okay, um, I'll get in contact with him. I said, here's my number. He rings me up. I go around to his house. I sit here. I meet his boy, his two sons. His son's 16. This uh, it hit home for me. Because as I walk in the house, someone shouts, he's at his front door. As I walk in there, someone shouts nonce at him. Because obviously the word is that he's groomed. He, he's one of the groomers, yeah? Woman shouts nonce at him. And someone shouts racist at me. <laughs> I look at him and, I, and as I walk in, I say, I think I won that one. Right. <laughs> but then I sat down with his kids and I thought, you know what? I get called a racist. That's had a very adverse effect on my children. Yeah? It's caused them problems. This bloke is being called a pedophile. Yeah? His 16-year-old son, and I remember looking at his son just thinking, your life must be fucked right now, bruv. He's had to leave school. He's getting bullied. I think, I don't know if I can say, I think he self-armed at the time. I think, so I, and I look, and I, so I spoke to Mo. I said, bro, I, I just want to ask you lots of questions because there was lots of reasons why his name was there as a groomer, yeah? And allegations of this and that. So I said, I, I want to get to the bottom of these questions to see why people are saying this. So, and he was an open book, this guy, yeah? Do you know what? He was a very colourful character to say the least. He reminded me at times of myself in how he... So when they said he was a groomer and there's a big protest, he drives down his ice cream van bib and his horn, yeah? Bear in mind, he's totally innocent. He's totally, he's totally innocent, yeah? There's no evidence against him. So that was his way of dealing with it. A bit like, I, I do that some, and that's my way of dealing with things sometimes. So, but then his, his family's been destroyed. So I meet him and I say, I need to find Ellie's family. And I go meet another Muslim business owner. Now, all the media are saying, I'm, I'm up there to stoke fear and rise against Muslims. The, it would have been easy for me to go up there and say, look, those are Muslim gangs. Mm -hmm. But, um, but well, I, she's unreliable. We cannot, no one can take what this girl says and see another man's life destroyed. So I met a Muslim business owner, had his restaurant for 30 years, family run business, and overnight his restaurant, restaurant's destroyed. And I felt for him. And I said, oh, I, I said to each of them, I said, look, People will still think this is a cover-up, yeah? When I come out and do a report and tell people what's going on here and that there's no evidence against any of you, yeah? Then the people who don't trust the system and don't trust the police will, will listen to that. And I, I didn't even have to say that to the Muslims. Each Muslim community member there opened their doors to me. One of the family, so I went to meet another Muslim family. They gave me information. One of those men they gave me information on has now been convicted. So there were men who were grooming in that town, but... It made me realise that trial by public opinion, I've faced trial by public opinion, I face it all the time, but I haven't faced it for pedophile charges. These men's lives were destroyed. So that's the, I've got a documentary that's coming out on Friday. And it's contrary to what everyone says about me because everyone says I'm just up there to, all I'm there to is report the truth. If the report, if the truth is the total opposite, then that's what I was there to report. And Where can people watch the documentary? On Rumble, unfortunately, only on Rumble, but you can follow me now on Twitter, can't you? So you get, I'll be sharing it on Twitter, but get me on Rumble because I'm banned from YouTube. Um, still, I hope that changes at one time. I'm going to try and st start my own podcast as a new, fresh, giving it, just doing interviews and talking about things because it's important to talk about things. Yeah, in a healthy manner. People always say, challenge them. My job is not, my job is to let people tell their story from their side. Yeah. People can make their own assumptions. The one that people always say, oh, you never mentioned this, the guy from the EDL, Peter Gillett, like him, okay. Liam Tufts is because I know Liam's a good guy to watch his videos. He's a funny he's bastard. Like, what, so, what's so the Pete, story with so that? Peter Gillett wasn't in the EDL when I led the EDL. Remember, I left in 2015. Yeah. Once I leave, Peter Gillett becomes a figure in the EDL. Yeah. He's convicted of pedophile charges against my friend. Yeah. Liam Tufts. Okay. But I met Liam Tufts. So I, I, I've never met Peter Gillett. So people always broadcast this look at this, his, fr his friends and senior. It's like, what are you talking about? Yeah, that is a man who was a predator and it's come out he was a predator he was convicted and given 16 years but I'm friends with his son you know, I haven't hid anything to do with him I don't even know him I've never even met him mm -hmm. but I, I, I don't mind being challenged on anything as I said I'm an open book I think it's important to sit around tables discuss everything it's important to do the same with Muslims it's important to do the same with everyone to so let everyone know there's a healthy centre for debate and you can have a debate without hating, hating each other yeah where does Tommy Robinson go for the future then like you have no charges hanging over your head for the first time like no, no, there'll, there'll be more you think I, yeah there'll be more you think so oh no it's lawfare it doesn't stop They've tied me up left, right, and said, I've got, I've, I've got another £27,000 bill here yeah, that's meant to be paid by the end of January. I can't pay it. 
So when they took me through the courts for this case, uh, the, the one I sent for the documentary Silence, I've got a documentary called Silence, which I've been given an injunction not to show anyone. Yeah, It proves how they operate, how, what they do. I had covert footage proving the, the corruption of the councils, all this. They took me to court. When I went to court, this is for a bottle of water over a child in up school in north of England. So I said, you're being lied to to the public. This is all a lie. You're not being told the truth. The public weren't being told the truth. The public were putting their hand in their pocket, back giving £160,000 to some Syrian refugee without knowing the full knowledge. I gave them the full knowledge. For that, they took me to court. When they took me to court, £700,000 legal fees. They took five witness statements off the Syrian refugee and his family. And when they put in their bill, it was £35,000. So I'm looking at the bills coming in. This is from the opposite side. I said, £35,000, take five witness statements. And they get 100% uplift. So £70,000 I get for that. So I realised straight away that this, this is financial terrorism. Yeah, I'd spend 80 grand or 100 grand on lawyers. In the end, I just said, I can't have any more lawyers. Yeah, I'll have to defend this myself. I haven't got another £100,000. How is anyone normal meant to go into a high court in England that £1.2 million is what it ended up at? £1.2 million for a bottle of water over a kid in the playground. What are, you talk, what are you talking about? It is, it is financial terrorism. It's lawfare. And then after that, so I had to go bankrupt. So I went bankrupt. And then I come out of my bankruptcy after a year so you can start getting on with your life. They pull me back into court to question me about the finances for that. Yeah, And then hit me for another 30 grand, 27 grand. It's like, well, hold on. They tried to hit me for 97. I'm like, but so I've come out of bankruptcy and now you put me straight back in it. So now they've just given me a court order. They've given me a court order. I've got to pay 27 grand by the end of January. Everything that you've went through in your life now, the, to the man you are now, that, what do you think your life purpose is, Tommy? My life purpose? No. Um, I think that... I think that people have to unite against the totalitarian governments that are coming. I think that people need to wake up to this whole control the carbon taxes the the meat industry the meat taxes they're going to put on the green energy the climate change all of it intertwines into one and it's all about taking your freedoms and when i say your freedoms that's my freedoms that's muslims freedoms that's all of our freedoms i look at the lgbtq plus com campaign and the sexualization of children and i know that the biggest defense to that in the uk will be the muslim community they will not tolerate it they will not allow it in the schools in this with their children and they're going for all of our children and i think that that is the next battle that fight is the next biggest fight i think that um so yeah and I think that, I think that my, my job, I see my job or my role and I just want to do media, make documentaries, make people think, expose corruption in any level I can. And um, yeah, that's my position. What do you think of the World Cup in Qatar there? Obviously it was quite successful, no violence for the first time. I was, no I was against it and then and, and ended up clapping them because I was against it in the sense that, but then when they tried to push their LGBTQ thing, Qatar's like, shut up. Mm -hmm. Shut up, yeah. Uh, and when I look, like, what what has the West become? Yeah, I'd use I'd I'd slam Qatar, slam Saudi Arabia, slam all these countries on their human rights violations on the countries they are. Uh, but what's the alternative? What are we giving them? What this LGBTQ plus trannies reading nursery rhymes to your kids, non-binary, no point. It's like you, everything we're spreading: the breakdown of the family, the levels of crime, the criminality. It's like what have we become? We've we've our country's in a mess a total mess so when you're preaching attempting to sit here and preach bearing in mind we fund we fund Saudi Arabia we fund the war on Yemen we fund all these wars we fund all this destruction and then we're sitting here preaching to these lot about human rights I just think it's hypocritical I think from our government so I think that Gary Neville's a sellout for going over there I think any of the people who who's claimed to care who went out there to support the World Cup but it, yeah it was a very successful World Cup um, I found parts of it funny in the end. I started laughing when the, when the, when the German German players all went like this. And when they went out, there's all, this, <laughs> all the Qatari pres presenters all, wave, all doing the wave at them and that. But um, I went to Qatar. I went to watch England play Brazil there. I went to watch England play Brazil in Qatar years and years ago. But uh, I don't think they should have had the World Cup. But then I also then think, that's, I then think that when you bring politics into sports, we all love sports, Keep politics out of it. Take the rainbow armbands off. Stop getting on your knees. Stop talking about any political things in the stadiums. Yeah, and just let everyone go and love sport. You know, I had the English Defence League. I never once bought it to Luton Town Football Stadium. Never once. 
But it's easy to push the narrative. If you've got the biggest sport in the world and if you're pushing something that, at every advert, every conversation, that's what they're doing raises now. Topics. That's what they're doing now. They're pushing it through football. If you're in charge of, if you become Prime Minister and you could change three things that could make the UK great again, what would you change? If I could change three things, this will upset a few. Well, I'd, I, I'd totally stop their climate change agenda. I'd totally stop. Again, I'd stop open border immigration um, and I'd send every one of these men in these hotels out of our country. Um, I'd s concentrate on the British people, the people that have given and sacrificed and families have in this country and concentrate on Britain rather than the globe, which was what globalism wants. What's the, just before we finish up, what's, see when you get cancelled, what's the steps that happens? Did you get a heads up? Listen, you're going no, to No, no, I was just gone. No, 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 my thing was I produced Panadrama documentary, which exposed the BBC like no one else has. It showed how they work. It showed them faking. It showed them telling people what to say. It showed them making a propaganda documentary against me. And within 24 hours or 48 hours, I was deleted off Facebook. Within uh, four days, I was given a court order by the then Attorney General to go back to jail. Um, and I was deleted from everything. So I was just, just and, and do you know what it is? I've been in my own little echo chamber for a while. So to, to, when you're, when you're reaching millions, you have this buzz about your work as well. You must get a buzz about yeah. your work. Yeah. You get a buzz about your work because people, you read the comments and people are changing their views, changing opinion. You're making them think, um, you're bringing stories, you're bringing change in people's lives. You're doing positive stuff. You're doing all this. And overnight mine was gone. Hard to deal with, hard to deal with. And then all of a sudden you, you, you're saying something, no one's listening, you've got, you've got no platform at all. But I managed to carry on working. I think the last 12 months I've done the most important work I've ever done. I produced four, document, no, four documentaries called The Rape of Britain, episode one, two, three, and four. I produced a documentary exposing Hope Not Hate as a government NGO organisation. I showed how they operate, the corruption within their organisation. Um, and I'm about to produce this documentary which shows about this girl who lied up in Barrow. So I've done that in the last 12 months. They, they're not getting the views they should, but I know at some point they will. Because at some point, Elon Musk has took over, so we're back on Twitter. Um, at some point, I believe that the censorship will be tackled. How does that feel being back on social media? It's a bit strange for you. Yeah, it feels good. It feels good. And I see so many people say, oh my God, where have you been? But I've still been working. I've st I haven't stopped. For the I haven't stopped my activism. It's just that people have stopped hearing it. Tommy, so, for coming on today again, mate. It's good to see you back. Thanks. Change the narrative. Would you like to finish up on anything? No, nah, just this, uh, thank you for thank you for inviting me on. I know you. Uh, how much backlash have you received? Not much. No. Nah. No. Nah. Anyone who gives you backlash, there's going to be four things you can see on there. Yeah? They'll have a Ukraine flag, or a Palestinian flag, or a Celtic flag. Yeah. <laughs> I've got shit for that. People still mention it, but again, uh, mate, I've interviewed murderers, drug lords, bank robbers. Everybody comes in their pants with these stories, but it's just a certain thing that happened a few years back. But. I'm never going to change who I am as interviewing people. Listen, you create views as well for me. You bring views, which means money for my family. Yeah. I can have nice things. That, uh, this is a business for me. I'll not shy away from any guest. I'll interview anybody anywhere. And like I say, I've not got a bad word to say about you. Yeah. Back in the day, I think it was a bit strange because there was a lot of shit as a Celtic fan as well. And you, you, My dad sat there. He's a Celtic fan. Yeah, it's just <laughs> mad. And I, I know that, that pissed you off as well because of the Irish and stuff like, yeah. kind of went against it. But it's only Twitter. I'm not asked. Oh, the Irish are the Irish are realising now. If you if you have you been, been following what's currently happening in Ireland, yeah, with the with the, the refugee the, crisis yeah, what, and stuff. I think the next six months, oh, keep your eye on Ireland over the summer. Keep your eye on Ireland because the Irish have fought for decades against the British being in their country, and they fought that battle. And they're handing it over overnight. And I think they're about to realise that Sinn Féin ain't nationalists. They're actually Marxists. Mm -hmm. And they're open borders. But yeah. Now, nah, thanks. I've enjoyed it. Tommy. Cheers, mate. Wish you all the best, yeah, mate. God you. bless you, mate. Cheers.